much. The presumptive <laughs> given. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Carl Ott coming to you from Dallas, Texas, uh, and president of the Dallas Personal Robotics Group. We're here tonight on our virtual builders night out. And as usual, we're just going to go around the table, see what people have to say on various projects. At some point, we'll probably also talk a little bit about uh, a uh, robot contest that we'll host this fall, hopefully, with any luck. Um, and at the very least, it'll have a virtual uh, simulation um, where you can, you submit your robot by a, a code, and it runs in the simulator to compete against each other. And uh, it may also have some uh, like mail-in videos for this time of COVID. So with that, I'm going to ask if we can have... Uh, Doug, give an update on uh, or non-update from his point of view, and then we'll move over to Donna, and after that, we'll wing it, and hopefully I'll be rejoining from the other computer. So, Doug, take it away. Oh, this is Doug. Just make sure I'm not mooted. Okay. So, I have very little I've gotten accomplished physically this week. I did add the uh, ultrasonic sensor to my robot that I'm working on. I'm going kind of slow because I'm wanting to blog about this, and I'm a little behind on doing all the the uh, video and stuff. So um, my other time has been spent getting my website ready so that I could blog about it. And hopefully in a week or two, I'll have that all together and then I'll be able to make more progress again. Although next week I won't be around because it's my anniversary and I'm going to do anniversary things. So that's about all I've got. Nothing big going on this time. I'll turn it over to Donna. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Donna from the SRS Seattle Robotics Society over <laughs> in Seattle, Washington. So a few, a, a really long stone throw away from most of you guys. I had uh, one main question uh, for everyone that maybe you might be able to provide some uh, insight into how to solve a specific problem. And then I wanted to provide some comments and on some other things that uh, I know that has been going around the room for a while on some other topics. So on to my first question. Um, I think I'd mentioned to this group one other time that one thing I'm trying to work on is, well, specific to an Arduino board, the Arduino Mega 2560 development board specifically. Um, I've got a one robot design that I'm specific like to a line maze where you need to store a lot of information for the route and that the and path planning that the robot has already executed. And so I need for the algorithm, the software algorithm that I want to do for that needs a lot more memory, specifically static RAM that than what the development board contains. And so I know for sure that the Atmega boards will allow for up to 64K additional uh, memory to be added. Okay, well, so, all right, that, that's not a big deal. Uh, and then what I wanted to do was add, as an alternative to that, I'm looking into uh, being able to use uh, RAM chips like that are SPI or I2C or microwire, some other kind of serial uh, type protocol. I also have a series of those kind of chips that could uh, supplement or swap out whatever uh, the case may be for the design that I wanted to do to be able to provide that extra RAM space, okay? So I know basically what it is I want to do for that, but I, I've never actually, for an embedded software project, I have yet to uh, be able to configure like with the linker file or linker script. I know for the direct, like in this case, 64K, up to 64K of additional on the processor address and data bus that you can add. I know for sure on that linker file or linker script that you can configure it so that the compiler will automatically bring in however you define your system for that project where you can specify that external memory. But what I'm wondering about is um, like the other type 
of um, memory that I'm talking about, like for the I2C or SPI RAM. Uh, if linker scripts can be configured specifically for those types of memories, or if you have to do it kind of ad hoc, uh, like with special uh, instructions that the, in this case, like the AVR libc uh, for GCC will provides to you. I'm just wondering if anyone on the call has had any experience with that or, you know, any kind of advice on how to proceed with working with adding adding those extra memories to uh, to, to my board. Hey, Murray, Murray. You're on mute, and I know you're waiting to okay. talk because a teensy. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Guys, had, thank you. Had like eight thank you. Of stuff to the backside of a teensy, right? I got yeah. a web page pulled up. If you don't, <laughs> I got I, Don. I have two questions. First of all, I take it that you have made a decision for the actual um, Arduino model that you want to use, and you don't want to change to a different model. Oh well, okay. So first off, uh. I, I'm doing this kind of as a learning a, an experiment. So I just, I want to, I want to, regardless of the practicalities of, of, do, of using or upgrading my Arduino board with added memory, I want to kind of uh, do some, a learning project sure. on, on, you know, with, with that, rather than thinking in terms of, of doing a different board, which I understand is, is a viable alternative okay. solution. But I just okay. I wanted to I wanted to look look into this other avenue. Okay, then the, then okay. Answering that, then my my second question would be um, more a clarification, I guess, is that um, this sounds in terms of performance, like when you're dealing with memory and you think about it in terms of performance. A lot of times, if you don't have enough memory, even on an operating system, you end up running to cache. So you basically dump your memory to hard disk or, or to SSD or whatever, and then run. So you, you have a performance hit in order to effectively serialize your memory to hard disk and then bring it back when you need it. And it sounds like for this particular project, what you need is a perhaps slower performance memory for longer term storage of your maze data than what let's say the memory you'd use for running your program. So you've already accepted that that bulk memory you're going to add is going to be slower performance, right? Right. Yes, that is true. Okay. Yes. Um, well, then m I haven't got direct experience with it on an Arduino, but some, like you said, some of these little boards that provide like I squared C memory are pretty easy to deal with. Um, I've done a little playing around with one of the Adafruit ones and you just address it and, and store things to it. Almost like I think one of the ones I used in a different environment was like a key value pair where you basically had almost unlimited memory in key value pair storage. If you wanted to act like actual system memory, that might be a different thing. And I, I don't have any advice in that regard. But if you just need bulk storage control via C sharp or I'm sorry, sorry, C C plus plus or um, Python, then just key value pair, that's pretty easy and performance is not a big deal. And that's relatively straightforward. I don't think that's a problem. If you want it to act like normal system memory, I think it's a whole different matter. Did, did you say how much memory you need? I'm not sure I heard that. Uh, well, I haven't done an actual analysis for the, the amount at this point. I'm still in the developing of the algorithm stage, but all I know at this point is that I will need more uh, well, heap heap memory is what I'm thinking of, and that's okay. why I'm asking well, then, all this. Um, well, that's RAM, and I, I, you know, I haven't done it with an Arduino Mega, but I just did a quick Google, and I think you'll find a lot of information out there how to attach external SRAM to that kind of device. And to answer your earlier question, yeah, it's gonna involve meddling perhaps with some linker scripts, but I suspect the information is out there. I don't have the answer. I can only tell you someone out there, I'm sure, has written down exactly how to set up your IDE so that that external SRAM is just going to be available and transparent to you. You know, done deal. Now, if you need it flash, then it becomes a different story. All the spy memories. The answer there is you'd be going through a library. It wouldn't, you wouldn't be addressing serial memories like native memory. 
unless you happen to have a processor that actually has it built in, and some of them do, uh, but but a, a Nat Mega doesn't. So it becomes a totally different ball game. You have to call a library, and and you know just access that flash memory. But if you need heap, you're talking SRAM, and then yeah, you you'd wanna you'd wanna figure out how to tweak the settings and the linker scripts to make it all you know, transparent to your code. But I'm pretty sure the answer is out there, even if we don't have it. Okay, right. And I there. yeah, and, and I have I have done some Google searches. I found some some great information. But you know, just to clarify a little bit more, I wanted to I wanted to try and get some added stuff there. Okay, yeah, so basically what I'm in my search, I just found that you know someone has a shield. I don't know if it's a problem. Oh yeah, and I and I found that as well. Yeah, and that was a a good seemed like a good solid design, made complete sense and all that. But okay, so what I'm what I'm clarifying, I just want to clarify what I think that I heard, as far as accessing serial memories that's non-native to the processor itself. Uh, I just need to concentrate on utilizing of a software library versus right. if I have native memory that I am adding this additional addressable, then I can go ahead and, and work with the linker script to yeah. have that. As, yeah, I, I think that's what I'm, I'm hearing. And if you have code, if you have an algorithm that expects to be doing a, a malloc of 64 kilobytes yeah. or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, then you, you can't be dealing with a linker script. It's just it's just not it's just you know then, sorry, you can't be dealing with serial memory, I mean, because it just doesn't work that way. You know, you gotta you gotta go the route of this SRAM uh shield kind of board. Okay. <clears throat> okay, hey, yeah, why why couldn't I there, that uh, comes to mind here, uh just from practical experience. I'm just wondering if you had an application specific type of need for addressing memory, then really, you know, I think I would not want to tang get tangled up into into some, yeah. you know, library that's gonna do heap allocation unless that's what you really need. I kind of think in terms of, for example, like accessing a frame buffer, you know, where you need access to a large memory space and you've got some limited little processor, then to me. I kind of like to think about my application. Maybe my if it's a maze and I need a, a 100 by 100 array or something like that, then accessing memory like that might just take a few lines of code to, to, to give you the ability to read and write from, let's say, a, a large array. And then you don't have to have this complicated library. You can just write the code yourself. That's just me talking about it. Right. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I agree. I, I, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Chris, back to your comment. And then I'll get off this topic. But back to your comment about uh, that if, say, if you needed, if you were working with the serial memory chip, okay, and you wanted to allocate uh, with the malloc uh, a large, a large uh, chunk, you were saying that serial memory uh, doesn't work that way. So why why is that? Well, because when you do a malloc. And there's all kinds of custom things you can do behind the scenes in, in how malloc is implemented. But what malloc gives you is a pointer, right? A mm, pointer yep, yep. to memory. Right. So now you have an algorithm, you have a piece of code uh, that you may not have written that's now making assumptions about the nature of that memory. And there's the basic assumption about what you can do with a pointer is that you can just write to that memory location, you can read from that memory location with you know machine instructions with low level machine code now when you're dealing with serial memories that's not how things work again unless you're talking special processes that have special support for it because some processes do um but the admega doesn't right and and if code expects to get a pointer to some block of memory you can't, there's no magic you can do behind the scenes to sort of map that to some library call that then does some magic, right? Because at the lower level, you're executing machine code somewhere that's literally trying to access a memory location, right? But a serial memory chip, accessing a memory location actually translates into a ton of interaction over this fly bus, right? You gotta send the address out. And then the data you know, command address data comes back. I mean, it gets quite involved. 
you know, talking to a serial memory chip, again, the libraries will make it easy. But if your code exists a pointer um, to a ridiculous chunk of 64K of RAM, you can't, you can't do that with spy RAM uh, or any kind of serially attached RAM. It's just not going to work. You have to change the code. Now, if you if it's your own code, your own algorithm, right? Um, kind of like Ron said, I mean, if, if, if there's things you can do yourself, if you're creating the algorithm, and what you have is a serially attached RAM chip connected to a spy port, you can just write your code from the get-go so that you know, you're kind of working with that limitation or with that constraint. Okay. The bottom right. line is that's just not how a code works. And unless you're planning to attack like a connected coffee maker and you want to take it over evilly, right? Like happened last week. <laughs> Proof of concept, you know, throw the rules to the window. You can just get down to the bare metal and code away. Okay. <laughs> Are you up for that, Donna? Just show us some uh, no, no, well, I, I I always believe in the adage: uh, use your use your skills for for positive things and not evil. Okay, but <laughs> but, but not you just have to be positive. Time. You just have to be positive that you're going to take it over. There you go. You're done. <laughs> but I think back to the point that was made earlier by 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 Murray. Right? You have to ask yourself the question: Do you want to go through that learning exercise of interfacing with some external memory chip, or do you want to focus on the algorithm that needs all that memory mm -hmm. and just go to a different board that has more memory? Right? Sure. But, sure. You know, oh, I know. I know. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Yeah, case in, case in point, uh, Adafruit makes a board that has the same form factor as the Mega. It's called the um, the Metro Grand Central. It's based on a SAM D51. It's got one mega flash and 256K of SRAM, so uh, considerably more than what the Mega has. Yeah. Um, That's a different one. Yeah. Um, the, the, the M4... It's got less pins than the um, the Grand Central, but but as far as I know, it's still based on the same part, right? Yeah, yeah. the same D fifty one. Yeah, I mean, they, this is the form factor of the this, and this is the same form factor as the Unrev two. It's you know, it's I don't know what that the it's called the Duo or whatever, but it's the most common form factor for Arduinos, and yeah. the different chips that are available are anywhere from sixteen megahertz up to one hundred and twenty megahertz, which is this one. So yeah. You, yeah, you can change boards, but I think as I as Donna said that you know she's this is not so much an exercise in let's say upgrading to a board that can handle it, but in a learning exercise, which I can appreciate. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't know if they're still making the do um, Arduino do or duo or it, however. I think it's there's, next, there's a there's a newer model of it. I think. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But if you were if you were lazy like me, uh, I just switched to one of those boards. <laughs> That's cheating, though. <laughs> well, hey, yeah. I'm still learning stuff. <laughs> yeah, just different stuff. Just different stuff. This is sort of the, this sounds very much like the discussion between David Anderson and I. He keeps telling me I should get down into machine code, and I'm kind of like happy up here on the top. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> getting down and dirty, you know. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, let's see. And then I wanted to comment. We've uh, over the last few weeks, I see that there's been comments about um, development environments that are 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 an alternative to the Arduino IDE. Oh, yeah. I uh, I personally don't like the Arduino IDE either, and so I I'm in the process right now for Arduino development of migrating to uh, AppMill Studio, like even uh, version. 6.6 6 or 6.1 or or 7 is uh, completely, I mean, per documentation, completely compatible with uh, Arduino boards. And it would, I think, the reason I'm attracted to that is the idea of, of so much um, use time that I've had in years past with Microsoft Visual Studio environment. And so, uh, it looks as though it's a 
you know, it's a rapidly a, a, a ramp up from the Arduino IDE. And I know someone else uh, brought up the, the IDE of uh, platform IO and now that sounds great as well. But I just wanted to throw out the idea about Atmill Studio uh, is uh, another idea. Um, and I know Carl that in years past, you've done some experimentation. I don't know how far you've really gotten with it in recent years, but in the past you've done some robo realm software uh, yeah. investigations. And I have a, an old license to it from like back yep. in 2013 or something like that. Yep. And I'm in the process of for vision applications uh, of getting ramped up on that as well. And I know it, I mean, it really looks like it's a, a cool platform, you know, in as far as the, algorithms that it supports and uh, configurability and all that. And uh, so, and I know of course that it's PC Windows based operating system, you know, that you have to ultimately run it on. And uh, so I know for me, I've got a, and this is what I wanted to comment to the group that if someone wanted to experiment with that software and have it actually usable on a live robot that one alternative is to have like a mini pc like a like a uh, an itx like mini itx board that you actually install windows on and uh, then you can you know have full access with your webcam on your bot to uh to robo realm so i wanted to just comment on that um, and then the last thing I wanted to comment on is to do with the virtual con contest that we've talked about in months past. And uh, the SRS is still kind of in limbo uh, as far as exactly what we're going to do on that front. But we do want to move forward with some sort of virtual contest. And uh, But I'm not quite sure yet how that's going to all pan out and what a... a target date range is that's still to be determined also so and i know carl from your introduction to the meeting tonight that we are planning on uh talking about the T dprg concept uh way that where you guys are going to go with contests so anyway that's all i had for the for tonight sure hey so let me jump in on robo room a little bit uh, so i'm just putting a link in here now uh, and I, I'm a big fan of it in a way because I learned a ton of it. I mean, I learned a lot by playing with it, and it was a great environment for learning. Uh, but uh, just for those who may not be aware, uh, I used it in an implementation which where the um, – I don't have it in a photo here easily, but the robot was basically wheels and a camera and a uh, pie and uh, – enough electronics to stream the video from the camera to my laptop, an old Lenovo. And then the Lenovo would do all the smart thinking and send burst commands to the wheels on the, on the robot. So it was a distributed robot and the, the robot that drove around on the floor you know, relied on this Wi-Fi connection. Well, uh, the, the thing is that uh, on the laptop side then, I had this server that would communicate via HTTP to the robot that ran around on the floor. And that was okay, uh, uh, ex except that there was two problems in this. And then, then it used RoboRealm on the laptop to do the CV. So it would, do, it would take stream from the robot over Wi-Fi to the laptop. RoboRealm would do pre-processing and feature extraction and then I made this Node.js server that would compute where to go and send burst commands to the wheel. So the thing about it was is that RoboRoom made the vision part pretty much trivial, but the, the problem came in on twofold. And the, and the first thing was that um, whatever the codecs were between the camera and the robot and RoboRoom, uh, the codecs were not at all tolerant to latency and jitter. And as I discovered after two or three years of really wasting a lot of time, the access points that I was trying to use, even though I kept buying higher and higher in access points, they were mal 
they were so high end that they didn't do the simple stuff very well. So they were adding latency and jitter. They couldn't handle quality of service. And then Robo Realm would drop out and lose the video stream, you know, a whopping 120 by 160, a really small one. And then and then the robot would start up, start acting on seconds old data. So, and then the other the other issue that I had with Robo Realm was that um, it uh, um, it, at least the way I was using it, I could have been doing things wrong, and I certainly was working on the fringes of its API, but it uh, it had uh, robustness issues. So I would get uh, eight and ten thousand cycles or frames into my sim into my running robot running around the course, and then it would just crash for one reason or another, and sometimes it would crash so bad that I'd have to reboot the laptop to get everything to run again. So again, I don't know if that was because of my sockets XML interface to RoboRealm or what, but anyhow, the bottom line is at the end of the day, nowadays, and when I did it, it was like you could free, or then you could get the $50 a year hobbyist license, but now it's very much geared towards corporate, like uh, installs in industry. So the first seat costs you 500 bucks. Now, now, the guy that does it gives really great support. And I really like, like I say, it's a great thing what he's done. But from what I could tell, the thing to do these days is uh, to find one of the uh, open CV libraries that have, uh, and some of them have, uh, it looked like there's similar wrappers around the libraries that give you GUI interfaces to the CV modules. So you can set the settings and controls and then have uh, windows into the, the processing pipeline. And uh, that, that's the approach that I was going to work on next. Uh, and if Kareem comes on board, I'm pretty sure that his uh, teams uh, with, Iron, with uh, uh, his robot, his high school robot experts, uh, I think they've got some, and, uh, uh, some pretty good uh, you know, wrappers around the basic CV tools that I think give you uh, many, if not all, of the benefits of, o of RoboRealm, except they're not all in one nicely contained, self-contained document and package, but but they're still pretty good overall. Okay, I've rambled through this, so I'm gonna shut up now. Because there are plenty of others on here that have more, more uh, CV experience than I do, so. <laughs> um, hey, let's move on then. And, uh, or actually, let me do one more thing since I've got the floor for a moment. So I'm gonna share something. Uh, I haven't seen anybody nod off and fall asleep just yet. Um, okay, Ray is getting there. So let me, uh, I have one thing. Uh, I know that there's some people on the line who like these robots that do musical things. So uh, right now you're seeing a photo of my photo <laughs> bike. And I want to ask, can, can you guys hear the sound when I play this? Okay, no sound? No. The now we're getting lots of wind noises or wind sounding sort of noise. Wind sounding noise. But oh, you're playing the spokes basically, right? Yeah, so basically I can get pretty far to Twinkle Twinkle had a little star because the bike shop had so far out. Of the and uh, it wouldn't, you know, this, this was 25 miles after they repaired a spoke. And 15 miles later, another spoke popped. So. I was just going to say that uh, your bike, your bicycle, you can play Twinkle Twinkle Little Had a Star, Little Star on your bicycle tire spokes. It's a bad story. On the other hand, if you go to the throttle to tune all the spokes that way, then you can imagine a robot plucking the spokes. So you can imagine a robot that would play your bicycle wheel playing little, right? I'm looking at you, John. Okay, this can be done. I wouldn't want to tune it, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have thought, well, Good. that is that you could actually use an Adri or Raspberry or one of those to tune the thing so that you would have a light or something that comes on that say, like, yeah, you hit it the right tension. So well, yeah, here, here's the thing: you see, all these spokes they're tied to the same rim. I know. So if you bring one spoke to the right tune, you're going to detune everything else, right? Yeah, but so the trying to is, tune all the notes in a song till they match correctly. 
I just can't imagine doing it. But by chance, I could get pretty far into Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Uh, this, this this what what happened happen to the true of the wheel? Well, that's the funny part because it was relatively true when I was playing Twinkle Twinkle had a star, but but because it's only got like 28 spokes, it it uh, and I'm not the lightest guy on the planet. Planet. Uh, anyhow, it didn't last but another 15 miles before uh, it popped. It basically, it's a harp, but with the same distance RPL. So yeah, it would. Yeah, it's possible though. <laughs> you could yeah you know, get a robot to tune the thing for you to the proper tune or whatever. So yeah. yeah. I thought I'd try to inspire you, John. So that's that's my inspiration for you. It is Let me fault. know when you get any progress. I'll help you if I can. <laughs> no, Actually, you know, what you could do is basically use some small hammers controlled by solenoids and effectively See? make yourself a bike wheel piano. See? See? Yeah. Now, yeah. OK Go did one of these. They had a deal where they had like three quarters of a mile of upright pianos, like baby grands. Mm -hmm. And they lined them up like a half a mile worth. And, and they had this car with the things sticking off the side of the car. And as they drove the car along, it would whap on these pianos and garbage cans and stuff. And they played a song that way. So there's an OK Go video like that. But yeah, I'm just trying to inspire you also. Make it happen. I want to see it. I've got a lot of time on my hands for that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Carl, set up now. Carl's just trying to ruin people's ability to win any contests by getting you steered off in some weird direction. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if you know. I actually have a band, and I've published a CD and all that kind of stuff. And out in right behind the wall behind me is actually a piano frame uh, harp, a piano harp on wheels. Uh, the next door neighbor managed to get a piano from a local school, and he wanted the wood, and he was going to throw away the guts. And I thought, no way. So I put some big, strong frame together, and we lifted the thing onto the frame, and then I bolted it in place. And I've actually got a piano harp in my hallway. And I actually have contact microphones on the soundboard, and I wheel it into our studio when we're making recordings. And it's giant; it's a giant microphone, basically. Because nice. the I don't know if you know, but the the strings vibrate sympathetically to whatever sounds they that are being they they're experiencing, and that ends up on the soundboard. So it's a giant piano microphone. Weighs I don't even know how much. It's like this, <laughs> three, three people can barely lift it. I, get it. Anyway. I bet it does some cool sounds, though. It makes the weirdest noise. If you just listen to the microphone coming off the piano when we're playing, it's just the, yeah. I think I'll publish something off that at some point, make a CD of ambient music or something. <laughs> sounds like fun. Carl, it sounds like you ride that bike harder than, uh, than I, uh, you know, I would ever ride any of my bikes. You're, you're popping spokes and stuff? Well, well, I like to say that uh, the... the 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 last two spokes well the last one I did was uh, was a gimme but the one before that I was at a stop sign and I was feeling really good so I just thought I'd jump on it and you know make it go so I got the one the, the, my left piston pushed down and pop wow it's not a mountain bike is it by any chance are you going no. on mountains no, no it's a I thought it was street it's a nice lightweight little road bike right. But it's going to get a new wheel now and new spokes. Okay, I'm going to shut up. Who, who wants to go next? Mr. Jack, do you have anything to share this week? It's good to see you. Oh, you're muted. He's walking. Hey, sorry. I was watching the uh, presidential debate real quick. Oh, no. So I don't, don't know. Yet. No good. Can you I don't really have anything to share. Oh, just from that. I, it, you're, it's better that you're here. What a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you really need to watch it, have it on closed caption. That way you can read it instead of hearing the noise. <laughs> the only way to watch that is Mystery Science 3000 style. Well, that too, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't really have anything to share. I tried to. I haven't really been doing much with robotics in the past three weeks, but uh, I tried to do the uh, data or the um, oh, like the why can't I think of what that's called when you do a schematic of all the stuff hooked up for my schematic. club robot? 
A block yeah, diagram. Really okay. Out. Yeah. All right. So I was doing that, but I, because remember, I think uh, last time I was talking about how the LED lights take 15 seconds to turn off once I turn the robot off. Right. Yep. Yeah. And I was trying to find all the uh, right numbers to write down for the individual devices, but I couldn't remember uh, from physics which data I needed, though. Like, is it just the voltage? Oh, well, so, okay, so you're, I think, okay, so just for everyone, if I remember right, to put, bring everyone up to speed. So you had a case where you had a bunch of these standard, like Spark Fun, Adafruit style modules all connected together. And uh, whatever yeah. was going on, and you also have servos and, and some other stuff hooked up because you got a lot going on on this robot. And you would do okay. something on one part of the system, like turn a servo on or turn this or that off, and then something else would reset or bad stuff would happen. When you did something over here, this other thing would screw up, something like that, right? Or something yeah, would fry. That it would take a long time for the LEDs to go out, right? Yeah, it would take. Yeah. I think it was, what uh, we did was power, we asked, oh, power oh. I remember, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like when he powers off and immediately power on, things are not working properly. I, yeah, yeah. I, that's so one we're, time I heard. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were trying to coax you to, um, to help diagnose and isolate the problem. We were trying to coax you to, to make a block diagram, so to just list the different modules you have by their part number. And then to say, like, which pin on this board is connected to which pin on that board. And then from there, what you do is is um, you start looking on the symptoms and working backwards, right? So, um, and that's what we were trying to coax you to do. Because it, cause it's easier to help you if you have a schematic or a block diagram. And then from there, okay. you say, okay, well, what can you count on? Well, you can count on the battery power. Well, maybe you can. You put an oscilloscope, and if the battery power stays constant, the voltage stays constant, then you know that's not the problem. Or if you know when you turn something on, oh, the battery okay. so voltage I just go down. Okay, so I just go down the list with my schematic testing everything? Yeah, you start with the power. Do you have good okay. clean power? Yeah. And do you have good clean uh, yeah. power at all the chips? And is the power nice and flat when everything is going on? Or does, do, you, okay. do you get these little glitches that happen? And do the glitches coincide with the problem? And okay. Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I seem to remember that you actually have a single power supply, like a battery, but you're breaking that off with a bunch of different regulators at different voltages? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, I've got two regulators. Okay. Mm -hmm. you're, I'm just wondering if there's any possibility you might be having some interaction across the more, if down the circuit, like at the sensors and... CPU, all you know, all the things you've got connected. It might be that somewhere down in those circuits, you might be accidentally connecting, let's say, a VCC of one power source from one of the regulators to the VCC of the other, and you might be getting some kind of a interaction between your power sources. So one thing okay. you might do, if you, one of those power sources can actually handle the load, is just for testing, move everything over to one power source if it can handle the load and see if that eliminates the problem because it may be at a power level that you've got interactions between power sources. Okay. Yeah, and here's a good example of that. I, I think On what Charles robot, basically is saying is to simplify, simplify. It, it, you just keep simplifying until you find the problem. Okay. And it's easy to pull stuff off until the problem goes away, usually. <laughs> So like, like Jack on this robot here, so that's got this one battery and at first I was using that battery to power an Arduino Mega and a shield for the motors and then I also have in here a um, three cell LiPo to five cell adapter and I was using that to also, so I was using the same battery to power the Mega raw battery voltage and then I had this this uh, regulator that would drive it would drive the five volt for a Raspberry Pi. And okay. It worked kind of fine, except I noticed that if I would give too big of a step command to the wheels, the wheels mm -hmm. would behave great, but all of a sudden the Pi would reset itself. Yeah, yeah. And right. I finally got down with the oscilloscope, and I found that sure enough, um, when I did a big transient on the motors. 
there would be a little bit of a quick droop on the on the battery voltage, but then that droop was just enough that it, it caused this voltage regulator to reset. So it would turn off for milliseconds and then come back on again. Even though it was just a quick, not very big glitch on the on the main battery voltage. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of stuff. And, the, and the, the, the workaround for that is that now when I run this with the Pi and the Mega, I use the batteries, uh, this light post cell to drive the motors. And then I take mm -hmm. a USB pack and I use that separate, totally separate power to power the, mm -hmm. the Pi. And now mm -hmm. I can throw whatever glitches I want on the motor. The, the Mega doesn't care, apparently. It's just that the Pi doesn't like the glitches. Well, or this, this regulator doesn't like the glitches, so... And then I'd amplify. That's where. And I, I basically the reason I made my comment is that I have kind of the same situation. I've got a big 18 or 20 volt Makita power volt power supply battery, and then I break that off until I think I can't remember now. I'm using two of those um, adjustable power supplies that David recommended me using model aircraft, and then I'm using two five volt regulators as well. So I've actually got four regulators. I have to be really careful when I'm connecting things to make sure that I'm not taking VCC off one and letting it connect to another because I was getting all sorts of interactions with my servos and things like that. So power supplies can be kind of tricky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think okay. the other thing we talked about was a single point ground too. I don't, I don't know if you okay. have that or not. Um, okay. That's a good thing to have. Um, yeah, single point mm -hmm. ground. It sh should be at the... At the battery, basically, all ground should go back to the ground lead of the battery, basically. Yeah, yeah, not the ground of the power supply, but the ground of the battery. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh. Dave, Dave actually, oh, okay. An IC design question for you. I thought most processor pins had like a for uh, for protection had a diode to VCC and a diode to ground. Um, so you could actually power like a processor through one of its pins based on that that you know uh, basically protection that was added so that i thought could be another thing that's going on where you have you know power from one of the regulators providing or you know powering something that connected to something that was powered by the other, other regulator and that could be one of the reasons why, you know, you could be like feeding through pins. Um, that could be why it takes so long for the, you know, the diode to basically go out or have such low current draw that, you know, they're not um, sending out light anymore. But correct me if I'm wrong, that, that's pretty common though to have, you know, that kind of protection on processor pins, right? Where you have two diodes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, Ray. And I've seen it, the, the, that effect where it couples back. Like you'll have an output pin and, and it, it'll couple back through and power the chip accidentally. Yeah. You accidentally are powering the chip through one of or something. Yeah. Right, yeah, right. Do the, Oops. Do the protection on the pin. Kind of a, a weird issue. And yeah, there could be situations where you've got signals going from stuff that's powered by one regulator to, you know, pins on something that's powered by the other regulator. And so that, that may be why your, your you know, after you reset, that it takes so long for everything to finally drain down. Um, that's, that's kind of weird that you mentioned on, on the, um, Palulu uh, um, Rami chassis, uh, when I turn it off, the power light does take a fair amount of time to go off. And, you know, it's like I can turn it on and then turn it off. And I don't know if you can kind of see that, but it takes several seconds for it to finally go out. And, um, you know, I was just thinking that there was enough whatever voltage on a or charge on a capacitor that it just takes a little bit longer or uh, you know the the capacity of that little power supply it's a little switch mode power supply is so great that it takes a little bit of time to discharge it because 
you know, the the only thing you may be doing is driving an LED or something like that. So at that, you know, as the voltage deteriorator or go back to ground. So is it not unnormal to have the motor shield LED stay on for about 15 seconds? 15 seconds seems like like a long time yeah um, a little while so, seems fine but yeah 15 seconds is a long time yeah um, i mean you got yeah, a lot of good gaps on two, there. but not 15. okay yeah just connect the motor shield by itself just connect everything else and see if the motor shield by itself you power it up and power it off does it last okay. that long okay yeah because yeah. yeah, it might be normal behavior, actually. At that point? Yeah, Murray's got some great great ideas there. Just disconnect everything. Power things up one by okay. their own from self at a time. Okay. Yeah, and All you right. might – I don't know if you've had previous experience with that shield, but you might find that that's actually normal behavior for the shield. But, you know, maybe, you know, you know LEDs don't mm -hmm. take much power at all – much voltage, I should say, at all. And so it might just be that the design of the board is such that the LED just simply stays on long, you know, after the board. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of hard the to know what's normal. Are not spinning, right, Jack? Mm -hmm. uh, no, the wheels aren't spinning at that okay. time. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things with the motors, you can spin the motors and light those LEDs. Yeah. So. It's a generator. Mm -hmm. Motor yeah. generator, right? Mm -hmm. Like a little DC generator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Take, okay. It, it's the uh, the robot equivalent of a clutch starting your car, right? You can clutch start. No, mm -hmm. no. It's you mean bump start? Is that what you bump. Yeah. <laughs> Bump start the robot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, who's next? Well, I'll, I'll go, um, not because I've got much to talk about. Um, as a few of you know from the mailing list, I've been working on PID controllers, and there's been some back and forth about the PID controller, and I just posted a copy of a log file from the robot showing this sort of hunting behavior. So I don't think we can debug it here, and so I won't take much time, but... In terms of progress, I kind of had thought I'd got to the point where the PID controllers were working, but apart and they work pretty well. Like I've I've got a, um, a effectively a script or a behavior I've written that is designed to start the robot at zero, move both motors two meters, at basically accelerate to twenty five percent of the distance, and hit cruising velocity, and then hit stay at cruising velocity until you get near the target, then drop down to what I call a targeting velocity, which is really slow until you can just basically stop at exactly the two meter mark. So that's what I'm trying to do. And so the log I posted is actually the, the port and starboard motors or PID controllers attempting to do that. The problem I'm having, which is what we've discussed in the um, mailing list, is that when I get to the point where the robot stops, it stops, but then it kind of hunts back and forth about an eighth of a turn of the wheels, and it will generally oscillate perpetually in that state. And so I'm trying to debug that. And like I said, I don't think we can debug it here, but effectively that's where I'm at right now. I'm still playing around with this bloody PID controller, but I'm getting there. And uh, thanks for all the help. Well, just one common part of the solution probably needs to be um, a so-called, I think it's called a dead zone, right? Basically where you say, you know what, if I'm this close to my target, it's good enough. Uh -huh. Because if you try to be exactly on target, I mean, one eighth of an evolution of the wheel, I'm sure there's something else going on. But even mm -hmm. if you start to figure out what's going on there, if you want to be exactly on target, it's just not possible. There's always going to be some oscillation. So you're going to mm -hmm. have to accept some error you know, maybe it's a couple encoder ticks. You know, as long as you're yeah. close enough within a couple encoder ticks, you're gonna have to say, you know, that's good enough. I'm within the dead zone. I call it. I call it done, right? But I think you've oh, got yeah. another thing going on that's 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 not bad. But once yeah. you got the the bigger problem sorted out, keep in mind the concept of a dead zone. I'm pretty sure you're gonna have to em employ that. Well, it consistently always overshoots the target by, I don't know, a couple hundred ticks, which is, you know, maybe an inch or so. I'm I'm not so concerned with it overshooting, and I can even tune for that. But for some reason, the robot comes to that stop at about an inch after the two-meter mark. <laughs> Here I'm mixing about two centimeters after the two-meter mark. And it stops. But then for some reason, it actually reverses and kind of goes back and forth. And I think that's – and as I think – 
a couple of people on the mailing list pointed out, that's probably a PID tuning problem, not a not a higher level behavior problem. It's something with the PID controller. And looking at the log, you can see that it has reached a target. The the script says in color, you know, we've got there. I've turned off everything set to zero, but for some reason, and I can't. I'm not really sure if it's because of the encoders. I don't think it's the encoders. I think it's quite literally the PID controller. And I'm just now starting to get into that. Is why is it hunting back and forth that, you know, it just keeps going like that kind of slowly, like back and forth, back and forth. It's yeah. bizarre behavior, but I was just wondering if anybody had actually seen that particular behavior before. Yep. That, I that would that be the integral term. I'm not using it. My integral is zero, actually. I'm not using uh, it. It's just P and D. Murray, my, my, uh, the one the robot is holding up a minute ago was doing the same thing. Oh. I forget what parts of the PID that I adjusted, but uh, it was a PID tuning, and when I got it tuned correctly, it stopped doing that. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Because I just figure I need to keep tweaking this. Was it tweaking or twerping or what? We talked about this last week, the two different Both. terms. <laughs> are, you using a, are you using a velocity PID or a position PID? Velocity PID, yeah. A PD controller, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm more of a position controller guy, and yeah. I guess the thing that I'd make sure is I had my my expected velocity ramped to zero at the right point. But I'm not any expert. I built my own CNC machine, so I have a nice, you know, fussy little platform that I run DC servo motors on, and mm -hmm. I do rely on an I term to pull me into a near exact position. But I also decelerate. You know, I, I apply a linear ramp, decelerate my expected positions or my expected velocity in effect, but it yeah. works fairly well. But I I have problems with with uh, you know when I introduce I term, it cleans that up, but then I tend to have problems with oscillation and things like that. So yeah. anyway, I mean, it's what we discussed in the last week or two is the fact that, and which was news to me and actually educational was that. Um, with those two kinds of PID controllers, the positional PID controller and the velocity PID controller, that the I term isn't needed in a velocity PID controller, that actually the I term is the actual position of the wheel. If you're, um, this is my understanding anyway, the I term is the position of the wheel, but if you're sampling at a fixed rate, you don't need that. It's not providing any value. But you do need the I term if you're doing a position PID controller. So for since I'm doing velocity PID controllers, I don't need the I term that that's not of any value. So I just leave it at zero. But that's my understanding anyway. Let's think about that. Hmm. Yeah, this. Um, well, well, you mean the I right. term didn't make it go straight. That is, so that your motors are all going at the same speed. Yeah, you mentioned that last week that you can use the I term basically for steering. Right. Yeah, to get it to it sounds strange. Line. Velocity is the derivative of position, and you are you are controlling velocity with uh, with p and uh, d. That yeah. sounds like my set, my set point is velocity. Yeah. I mean, if if compared to a position, you are already derivative. You you, are, you already have a derivative in there. So it sounds like uh you have uh like, no, let's not you know, you need an eye term. You you run an eye term. is that control, what you're saying control integrate your velocity you get position therefore you have to therefore it. your error if well let's see technically if you were um if you if you haven't reached your target your expectation will be to have some positive velocity and if so therefore if the velocity drops to zero really we could say to ourselves we have a problem we need to we need to get the velocity back up because we've we've fallen short of our target so i think you see what I'm saying? You haven't reached your target. Your expected velocity is something other than zero. Therefore, if, if, it, if you keep outputting a zero velocity, you'll ramp up an error when you integrate those terms. And in effect, you're, you're, you're saying, I haven't reached my target. So I integrate that and I get position really. But I, I, I think an I term is fair in a velocity controller, if I'm thinking correctly. Hmm. I think, uh, I mean, look, if, if the position error is zero, is, is, a, is a fixed number, 
velocity error is zero. And, and he doesn't even have a eigen for that velocity error. So I'm, I don't really know why the robot would go to a specific position but with the P, PD, PD for velocity. It doesn't even guarantee a fixed, like zero error on the velocity or the, I don't know. I, I, I think it's strange. <laughs> for me, well, I'll, okay, the I way that you... position, that'll guarantee you to go somewhere exactly. <laughs> Well, the way that David's David Anderson has explained this to me is that for a velocity PID controller, you can start with just the P without any with zero on the I and the D, and just basically tune it up with a P alone, and then you add D, and then tune that so you don't have any vol any um, oscillation. And the, and the way that it, he explained it to me, and this is actually in the mailing list as well, is that the I term, as Dave Ackley's pointed out, is actually the difference between the two motors, if you want to use it that way. But for a single motor velocity PID controller, you only need PD. And that is so long as you are sampling at a fixed rate, in my case, 20 hertz, so long as you're sampling at a fixed rate, the I term fall effectively is the output of the, of the controller. Hmm. Yeah, I have to go through this myself. <laughs> but think about this. Think about this. You're using this velocity controller, and what are you trying? What are you telling me you're trying to do? You're telling me you're trying to drive to a point, aren't you? Well, no. That, no, no the, the only thing that the pit controller is doing is not driving the robot to a point. It's setting the velocity of the motor. So if I say set the velocity of the motor to 15 centimeters per second, and that's a certain number of ticks, and my feedback is ticks, encoder ticks, then what my PID controller, my, my velocity PID controller is doing is making sure that the motor is at that velocity. Okay. Right. But, but it won't and be exactly at that velocity because you have to have an error for it to have any drive. Right. So, so the the point of putting the integrator in there even with a velocity one the point of putting the integrator in is that if you want to get an exact speed you have to have the integrator otherwise you will have less than the speed that you specified uh -huh. but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's observable but if i set my target speed to let's say 50 it'll sit there at about 45 or 49. Exactly, that makes sense. exactly. and the five okay. error that is the drive. Okay, yeah. right. I can yeah. see that. Need that okay. for, for a P to work or D to work, I mean, for a P to work, you need an error. When yeah. the error goes to a constant, the P and D won't do anything. That's true, but that just means that the motor is at a fixed speed or fixed velocity. Yeah, not right. the one well, you're yeah. specifying. It's just yeah, so if, I specify, if I specify a certain RPM and the motor is at that, at that velocity, there will be an error of zero. Yes, exactly. And therefore, no drive. Well, I mean, no, it's at in speed. other words, if the error is zero, yeah, you will you will find a drive. That, that's, that's drive. Right. So zero error gives you no drive, and you will slow down. <laughs> yeah, so it won't basically it won't be a steady state that you get. You have speed. to have an offset unless you have the integral. Yeah. The integral is what drives that offset to zero. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I am actually another way. Another way to, to approach it that I've done is, um, and I'm not sure what the right terminology is to be honest. But, but basically, you know, if you pick the robot up and you, you, you drive it sort of without a load, right? If you drive your motors without a load, um, you apply a certain PWM duty cycle. You know, you're gonna get 50 encoded ticks per time interval, right? Something like that. Of course, the problem is once you're on the ground, various conditions, right? Obviously, you're not meeting that exact speed. That's why you need the, you know, the PID to regulate. Right. But if you approach it, and I think feed forward is maybe the right term here, right? If I know that I'm going to need to apply approximately X amount of commanded uh, motor power, to get to my target speed, then I'm just going to start with that with that value, right? Regardless of what my PID is doing, I know I'm going to need at least a P 
PWM duty cycle of 50%, right, to approximately reach the target speed. Now the error comes in and it says, well, you're off. Okay, so now we got the feedback loop correcting that error. But that way I don't have that problem of my error going to zero and then suddenly I turn my motors off because, you know, my PID says, well, we are on target, therefore I don't need to correct, right? I always have that minimum, you know, PWM duty cycle that's getting applied just because I know that's what I'm gonna need minimum, right? No load, to drive at a certain speed. And then so what the pit loop has to correct for is then in, in essence a much smaller error, right? It's gonna be a small error that I need to correct for, but it's gonna be much smaller they compared to trying to let the PID, uh, you know, take care of the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and feed forward approach. That's yeah, that's what that's exactly. Right. It's a feed forward yeah. approach. In yeah. fact, what I've done to 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 even put less stress, so to speak, on the PID loop, I even took a couple of data points that tell me, all right, as my battery voltage goes down, mm. well, I know my I'm going to have to increase my, P, my, my PWM duty cycle, right? So I'm actually baking that in as well. I know exactly that I'm going to have to apply a certain PWM duty cycle to try to get the speed. And again, so I'm kind of minimizing the amount of work for my PID to do. And I think in the end, it's not even a PID anymore. I think I just have an integral term, literally, to do that yeah. final little bit of correction because there isn't going to be much more correction left to do just a little bit, and now all of a sudden the work, the, the PID or I or, you know, whatever you want to just do, it becomes much less work for that feedback controller to do, and that it's just easier, less oscillations that way, I find. Yeah. Well, Chris, in fact, um, what I think I described last week was that my first attempt at a pit controller, and I'm on version four right now, was that I had baked everything into the pit controller. I had slewing and everything in there, and on David's request or suggestion, um, I've effectively made a PID controller. I've got a PID class that is just the PID controller. I've now got a PID controller class that wraps that and gives me configuration and all that. Now I've taken, as David recommended, my SLU control up to a higher level. And so everything happens at a higher level. And then at the very low level, as you said, my I'm using what's called a Thunderborg, which is a I squared C um, motor controller and I actually do like you said sample the battery voltage about every 10 seconds and I adjust actually what goes into the Thunderborg as what it thinks is the 50% and 100% mark so basically the PID controller the actual PID controller is now only doing PID and the, you know if you look at the class itself it looks kind of like any of the PID controller libraries you see it doesn't do anything so slewing all the stuff we're talking about, chain, you know, ramping up, ramping down velocity of the robot is all happening, as David suggested, or other people as well, at a higher level. And the pit controller is literally now just a pit controller, nothing more. And that made things a lot easier. Now I can understand kind of what's going on, a, a little better anyway. Hey, it was all too complicated before. Yes, Ray. Oh, hey, Chris, I had a question. Your, um, um, like the the equation then you have some command times well like the command would be the number of ticks you wanted um or the speed times some factor that gets you the correct pwm so some multiplier or coefficient right. so you have that term plus the proportional term plus the integral term plus the differential term then, right? yeah so i I, I would have to go back and look at the final code for that robot, but but I think in the end, it's really just what's left after after all the feed forward, right, which takes into account current battery voltage. I think I just then have left an integral term to make the, you know, to just kind of make minor adjustments to get to the exact target speed. Because mm -hmm. in my experience, I wasn't all that far off, right? Um, of where I want it to be, and so there isn't, there wasn't really, there aren't really big adjustments to make anymore. Once you're doing your feed forward control, the idea yeah. is you, you get pretty close to your target that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Not exact, but you know, there's not much left correction to do, and I think it's 
technically just an integral term that I'm mm. using to say, you know what, okay, I'm, I'm a little too slow, so let me let me increase the motor speed. So it, it might be, again, I'd have to look if it's, it's technically just a proportional term or just an integral term. I, I can't tell you from memory, unfortunately. Yeah. But it's nothing complicated. It's one of those two, mm. you know, no D involved, that's for sure. It's either just a P or just an I to make that that final minor correction. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I use. Um, you know, a PI controller. The differential, you know, jerks the motors around too much. It's it applies too much energy, and um, you know, it just kills. Seems to kill the batteries quicker. And so I just you know, let it ramp up slower <coughs> without the differential term. It seems to work okay. Do you yeah. think that possibly if I swapped using, like right now my I term is zero, but I'm getting that hunting behavior, that back and forth behavior. If I maybe stop using the D term and swap over and start using an I term, I can basically eliminate that, that hunting behavior. Maybe that's what it's from, is the D term. Um, I think one of the things that, that you might want to look at is when it reaches whatever position you want it to reach, you know, you, you probably still have, you know, a significant PWM applied to the, the motor driver. So it's probably going to pass that at a, at whatever velocity, you know, it probably reach that velocity and, and probably is going to pass that at it. Um, so if you, um, I, I would guess it doesn't have as much to do with the pit term as you know like especially with rotating platforms if you rotate them too fast they'll they'll hunt quite a bit um because you you've gone past your target and now you're you know if you're just moving at it too quickly um as you as you approach that position you could you know taper off the drive and i bet you it would either hunt a lot less or not hunt at all and then yeah, actually, my, the point I was making earlier is that I'm trying to hit a two meter mark, and I'm always about I don't know 50, 50 ticks past that. So maybe right. it's actually trying to back up and get to the point where it's supposed to be. I don't, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. So like my question is: Are you actually doing a combination of velocity and position control, or you know, is it? If I get you know, hitting the exact target precision, right? Yeah. If, you, if you just command your velocity to go back down to zero at whatever position you're at, and you don't care, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Would it still exhibit the same behavior, right? You just let it, it does, go yeah. in seconds, whatever distance that amounts to, you tell it to ramp down to zero, would it then also rock back and forth like you're describing? Well, in fact, since we started this, there was an email on the list from a guy named Rudd who was questioning the log that I'd posted, and, and he hadn't noticed, that, I guess, that I've actually got a port on the starboard controller. But actually, that is what happens. When it gets to the two-meter mark, the set point does get correctly set down to zero. So in theory, the PID controller has a set point at zero. There shouldn't be anything happening at that point. The motors are, you know, they at one point stop, and the PID controller has a set point at zero. So something mysterious is happening, and I just need to debug it again. Okay, wait, um, wait. So, so the set point is zero. So you are, are you basically then slamming on the brakes on your motor? No, no. They, it actually goes. Am I get to a targeting velocity? The, the robot's running like at maybe ten percent of velocity. It's running very, very slowly so that it can come to a stop at the two meter mark, and it does stop. But then it kind of continues after maybe a half a second. It kind of goes uh, 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 back and forth. Because could could the inertia of the robot play a role here, right? Because you you're saying uh, no, no, no. Because it's quite a high gear ratio. It's something in the software that's doing it. The robot has actually stopped, and it's like, I remember what, the 45 to 1 or whatever the gear ratio. The robot's literally just sitting there, but then the ro then the wheels kind of kind of just kind of hunt back and forth in this oscillation. So, yeah, it's just a bug, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you just have the robot sitting there, stationary, does it do the hunting? No, it's only when it comes to a stop after doing this little two-meter jaunt. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, this yeah, one, yeah, weird. If I um, if I rotate it too quickly, um, 
there's there's kind of a thing you can do a little test you rotate it 90 degrees stop it rotate it you know 90 degrees and stop it. so you do that four times and then you should end up back where you started you know with the same like angular orientation and if it doesn't then you know your kind of the factors for rotation are not quite right so you have to kind of play around with it a little bit but on the um and I had, I had used that routine forever. It's, it was an old routine that I just ported from robot platform to robot platform. I know you've seen the word. Um, <laughs> on this thing, though, um, the, you know, I'm, I'm having to use some of the libraries that Olulu provided. And if I, you know, if I turn it too quickly, it would, like, not come to a stop. It would just, like, Co you know, wrote, continue to rotate, but at a much slower rate until it got <laughs> the next command, and then it would, whoom, you know, speed up again, and then go to the slow mode where it was supposed to actually be stopped. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh my God, why is it doing that now? So, um, yeah. but yeah, it was that, you know, um, the it was just rotating too fast. Basically, it would it would kind of go past that mark, and then there there were like a few counts left over and so it would main think it thought it apparently had to maintain that speed which was considerably slower than i was rotating it but it mm. would still do it and still rotate it was, it was bizarre so so basically well, what i had I to do is just, I, I i won't take up any more time with pid controllers although i know you all have a great deal of affection for them but i mean what i it, in a sum, summation my i'm getting 494 ticks per wheel rotation so it would only take the motors to be ticking over very slightly let's say maybe 10 or 15 ticks so it may be that the encoders are creating an oscillation just because they're giving enough information to the pid controller to keep moving somehow so i'll just yeah. have to yeah. anyway enough about my pid controller <laughs> anyway what, Sorry, what, what solved it for me i had to zero out all of the uh um like the encoder counts and mm. um you know the the command for you know the number of ticks um mm. and then i had to wait a little bit and then zero them out again because i found that if i didn't wait uh, and the motors were spinning too quickly there was like a residual count left over and the thing would still yeah. you know rotate very yeah, slowly well, and these are not a little bit <laughs> So anyway, cool. Well, what are you working on, Ray? Um, I have been playing around with um, Laura radios. I had two different versions. Hmm. Um, there's one based on this is the a 32U4 processor. Oh, yeah. cool. um, and then there was another one based on um, the STM 32s. And this one had a little display on it, a little OLED display on the back. And that's the eh, kind of the front side. I don't know if you can see that much of it. And then the uh, the display is on the back side. And um, what I was going to do, um, I had the the humongous joystick from uh, I think um, BG Micro sells them now. The you know Caucasians are too damn big kind of joystick. It's huge. Um, that was connected or that's connected now to one of the lower boards, and I was just you know testing out different uh, distances and antennas and that kind of stuff. Um, what I eventually want to do, I have the same boards that uh, Kareem has. These are the um, um the uh, gps with uh rtk and they're the um the modules made by ublocks the neo mp8 dash twos and um bought them around christmas time and when they were on sale and um one of the suggestions that spark fun had was that you could use laura radios to um Send the correction data between a base station and a rover, and so that's why I'm kind of getting into the lower radios again to be able to actually power these puppies up and try to do what Kareem was doing. So, pretty cool. 
I, I doubt I'll do it in time, but you know, I could like mow dump Trump in the 14 acres or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. But so so anybody flying over in a plane or helicopter or whatever could see it. Oh look. I was gonna anyway. ask one thing about those. Are those fairly low power? Could you run them on a small robot with a small battery, or do they tend to take up a fair bit of power? No, they're very low power. Um, the maximum output power is um, 100 milliwatts. Mm -hmm. But you know they do several things to to try to get the range. You know, um, but they actually these actually have battery connectors on them, and oh. you can run the. Um, let's see if I can see it. That little thing right there is the battery connector. Mm -hmm. And I have. Um, where are they? So you can run an independent battery for the power. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't worry. What is using my batteries? You know, it's time to clean your desk when you can't find anything on it. Yeah. Oh yeah, here they are. These are just little. I think they're 640 milliamp hour. Oh, 670 milliamp hours. Um, it's just a little flat battery, and you know, I soldered on the, the little connector for it. And you can run it on that, or you know, there's, um, <clears throat> you know, an input for five volts, and it's got a little 3.3 volt regulator on it that, uh, mm. you know, you can also provide power that way if you want. So, mm. but. Um, yeah, I did. A, I don't. I don't know if you saw it or not, but I did a presentation where I, you know, drove all around and walked all around my property because the the little um, HC12 module that I had wouldn't go a very far distance, and I really wanted mm. something that would cover the whole property. And, um, it does, and kind of the other nice thing about it is um, you can read what the it, it's called the RSSI received signal strength indicator is. Yep. And so and you've got a huge budget, I think like um, um, 148 dBm. And you know, to the, the far reaches of my little little piece of property, um, I don't think it went below a hundred. Wow. So you know I've got plenty of margin. Um, mm -hmm. I could still receive it on, you know, the backside of the metal building underneath the solar array. It just seemed to work everywhere. Hmm, cool. Um, so I'm kind of hoping it's going to work that well with uh, as the radio link between the, uh, the base station and the rover for GPS RTK. Hmm. Cool. So maybe maybe I can write big letters. And, you know, that can be seen from space. I <laughs> like what Kareem was doing. You have to show us. That'll be good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hey, well, let's bounce on. So we, we made Ron wait till the very, 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 very end last time. How about if we let Ron go go now this time? <laughs> I know Ron has some <laughs> updates. sorry about this. No, Ron's oh, man, been a very Ron busy boy. Out. Yeah, uh, and Carl's been trying to get me to, to learn uh, GitHub, and I've used it sort of in the past and here and there, as it might be. But anyway, I think I now have this uh, project up on, on GitHub, and I actually I've got it on a different uh, repository than I set it up initially. In fact, I'll, I'll just let me present here. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, Is it the same one I forked on? Uh, no, <laughs> well, of course not. <laughs> it's changed. Sorry, and there's uh, probably let's see. It's, I got the right screen. Wait a minute. Uh, let's see. Are we seeing uh, my repository LFS? Indeed. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, no, Carl. Sorry, and I could probably just clone this over to that other repository and wipe it out. And but let me. I'm just. I got this up, so I'll I'll stick with this for the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, so the line following simulator, really, I do have and have it, but I haven't tested the ability for someone to take 
uh, this repo and uh, download, uh, oops, hang on one sec here, uh, find myself. Anyway, I haven't tested the ability to create a library project, but for the most part, people aren't going to be interested in that. They're going to want to just use the library code. And uh, so anyway, so I've got this thing up, and uh, let's see, what can I say about it? Well, it's probably somewhat self-explanatory, but anyway, uh, now any changes I make will be pushed to this, this uh repo and I'll talk to Carl later about whether we should stick with the repo that he has an initial uh, fork of or whatever. But anyway, this repo should be good. And really what's here that's of interest is uh, in particular, if you don't want to get into creating your own uh, library editing capabilities in Eclipse, which is kind of a little task in itself, what is here is a distribution uh, version of the program, and that's in this folder called distribution. And here is where you're going to find uh, in, under download, there's uh, this, for example, the latest zip file. I don't know why there's a dash one and, a, and not a dash there. I'll have to see what that's about. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, I'll check that out. But anyway, this zip folder is the thing that, or this zip file is the thing that you would want to unzip and then copy to your processing libraries folder. So in other words, uh, what we have is under sketches, just to review, under your sketches folder, which you can find in processing uh, by going to preferences, uh, the sketches folder will have a libraries folder. And this is where you're going to target this zip file or this unzipped version of the zip file. And anyway, in there then, what you're going to have is you're going to have a reference, and that's going to have your API. Uh, reference with you know everything uh, explained as far as the different uh, methods that are available to the simulator but I think most importantly really are the are the uh, samples but this is a great reference you can go visit if you've got a question and there's probably it's probably worth a quick read if you're going to get into this so anyway so that's the reference but then also we've got, uh, let's see whoops I just closed here we go so within your libraries folder also, uh, there's examples, and these are actually accessible from, and I, I may have talked about this, from processing. Processing, processing, I can't say it, my voice is shot. Uh, let's see, and I'm going to bring processing up. And so anyway, once you copy that folder in and we say, um, let's see, we go to examples, we'll find the, uh, and I'm going to bring this folder in one sec, and then I'll, We'll find the library for the simulator, and I'm going to load Will's trike. And I don't think we had this last week, but interestingly with his trike, we did something. Uh, Doug Parody was talking about, uh, let me see, user init. Doug Parody was talking about being able to vary the time step for the simulator. And actually, I did that for Will's trike, and the cool thing is it speeds the run up of the uh, trike three by a factor of three even though it's not driving any faster. Let me run, get the program up and I'll show you. So here we are, uh, Will's trike, but now running with a, a coarser time step, which will allow the simulation to execute quicker, but you'll notice that it's running faster than real time. So let me start his, his robot pressing R to run. And it does have a, a relatively long uh, acceleration time. But anyway, uh, just for fun, which is probably a goof. I could, I, sorry, I could have, I could have a faster acceleration on his robot. But anyway, uh, so you'll notice the real time is ticking by. We're now at a minute ten. You can see it's about two or three times normal speed. But the cool thing is, this allows you to run the robot uh, and see the results faster. Now we can certainly throttle it using the number keys, for example. Uh, let's see, the number one is about one step a second. I can freeze it and single step it, or we can pick an arbitrary you know, mid-range speed there. And his, his robot, and this, this version is going to goof up. Oh, wow, it goofed up there. That's interesting. Um, maybe I did something to it. Let me, I'll restart that. That's puzzling. It still made it pretty far. Yeah, um, um, but I'm kind of puzzled. 
uh, I maybe I did something. I goofed it up. Wait a sec. Um, oh, maybe I discovered a bug. Hang on. Let's see. Oh, I'm puzzled. Wait a minute. I'm going to restart the thing. <laughs> I haven't had to do that. That's been pretty stable. Let's try it again. Maybe right. in the excitement, I pressed some weird key. Demo of I don't, I don't think it's a bug. I think it's just an undocumented feature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> well, let's let it run this time, and I'll quit fiddling around. Uh, I was fiddling with uh, slowing down the time steps, but that should have no impact on the simulation. And I'm curious. I may have inadvertently did a mouse click or something and, and moved the uh, robot, but let's let it run this time. Uh, so again, the speed at which the simulation runs has nothing to do with the actual, you know, a number of steps or updates that the robot's taking. And the goal is to make this up. Oh, that's interesting. Ah, oh, interesting. Different behavior. Okay, I'm puzzled. This thing would 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 go to the the uh, the sine wave tile and mess up every time. But and now I'm puzzled because I'm claiming that the simulator is uh, deterministic. But you know what this means, Ron? It Hold means on, we that? all have hope. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Anyway, uh, but you know, with the, with um, I supposedly can run this course, but I haven't been able to find my code, so I'm thinking I was lying. <laughs> anyway, so there it is, and it's all, it's waiting for everyone. But really, the the demos are good. Will's trike is kind of complicated. But uh, again, my favorite example would be probably the simple bot, uh, even though uh, this is really only designed to solve the uh, simple course, uh, which I actually have it where you can load two different courses. Um, but this one, oh, I, you know, I'm guessing now maybe it has something to do with I have killed the acceleration rate on the robot. Let me fix that. I was using that as a demo very slow acceleration and it now occurs to me that that may be a problem with why will's robot failed so radically so just for fun and not to suck up too much time here and be happy to answer questions let me kill that that one does run but i'm going back to will's and what i want to do is right here where i set acceleration rate i picked an arbitrarily really small value so i'm going to fix that Acceleration and deceleration are now both at 32 inches per second. And most of these, I would just probably stick with those values. But let's see what happens to his robot now if it does any better. He, he thought with this crude of a simulation step, 20th of a second, that it would not run. But uh, so far, I found that it has run OK. But let's see what happens. Hey, Ron, well, this is moving around, around so. I noticed, I noticed that you've got a license, license attached. Are you comfortable you with it in its current state? People just starting to mess with it? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And I, I, I'm thinking I'll try to add some documentation. If you, if you really want to mess with the internals of the simulator, you don't have to set up Eclipse. This is where it goofs up. Okay, perfect. There you go. This is the. This is exactly what I expected it to do. And what I've forgotten is in demoing the slow acceleration rate, that disturbed the robot quite a bit. So in other words, the robot was fully able to slow down quickly, but very unable to speed up quickly. And that, that did have an impact on his, on his controller. So anyway, uh, and again, really, this whole thing is all about just reading sensors and then then and then looking at the sensor data and deciding you know how fast to turn and how how fast to drive the robot uh subject to the acceleration and deceleration rates so really there's not a lot you have to do especially with the demos here where you can see you load a demo in and then save it as your own thing and then you go in here and change the things obviously like to your name and your robot uh and and leave this stuff alone and then in the case of your robot, you define your sensors. And then in the case of your controller, uh, you end up reading those sensors and making your decisions. So, uh, but again, the, the simple bot, I, that's my favorite starting point because I wrote it. <laughs> but the simple bot just doesn't have a real complicated, you know, it has a single sensor. So in your init code, you end up defining, well, these sensors aren't even used. They were for demos. 
but the real sensor here is just this one sensor with 65 elements in, in, in its position. And then in the controller, uh, we just have a real simple controller, and this one is not really suitable for the challenge course uh, because it's only going to pick out one span um, of, uh, in other words, one intersecting line. So it is a dumb uh, routine here. So you'll want a better routine. Uh, but you could look at Will's code, perhaps. And uh, we'll decide if, if anything else gets published. But the only thing that I really lack, uh, and it's and maybe it wouldn't go for this, this contest, is I believe, let's see, when I start this up, we're, we're not permitted to, to drag the robot. So when I start the contest run, oh, I've got a slow acceleration there. When I start the run, I'm not permitted. I'm trying to drag it. I'm not permitted to mess with the robot. But if I can reset it, I can say go, the G key. Is that documented? Okay, I, I need to document that. With the G key, uh, I thought, ah, let's see. Okay, I'm going to have to check that out. My goal is to allow you to, to manipulate the robot while in motion, but I see that that's not, uh, not happening. Let's just try it again. Here we go. Uh, no, okay, I'll have to check that out. So I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, when you go... You need to be able to manip you can manipulate the robot, um, so that's a that's a problem. Uh, no drag. Okay, I'm just making a note. And the other thing is, this information here is not easily accessible. This is the real position and heading, and I'll stop the robot. This these numbers here are the real coordinates and the real heading of the robot. But if you try to do your own odometry, it's going to, you should be able to get pretty close to, uh, with no disturbance in the simulation, you should be able to come up with these numbers. And I'll have an option where you could verify your own odometry that way. In other words, one mode is to tell the simulation to be perfect. Oh, and also the other thing is in non-contest mode, you can inquire, where am I? And what is my heading? But in contest mode, uh, the thing that hasn't been worked out is a slight disturbance to the simulator, causing your robot, for example, not to quite drive straight. If you if you tell it to take a heading of, uh, let's say, from this point, a heading of zero should bring you to this point. Well, when you tell the simulation that, it's probably going to have a little curvature. It's not going to be exact. But internally, your own odometry could help with localized information. In particular, my thought is when you're encountering a feature, it's very nice. You could say, ah, you know, I don't know what's going on, so I'll, I'll note where I am. And then you'll have at least some rough idea using odometry if you need to, if that makes sense. Now, I'll shut up and let anybody ask any questions. Okay, I'm going to jump in here because, well, first of all, I think we, we all need to really thank Ron for just jumping on and doing this because this is hey. really phenomenal, <laughs> right? For anybody that's tried to do anything like this, for him to have pulled off this the capability that he's done is really phenomenal. The next thing is, while he was talking, I, I went and put a link to his the GitHub repo he was showing, and that's now in the chat window for this. Uh, and my question is really for the group, if just a kind of visual show of hands, um, how many people can we twist and coerce on the call right now that be interested to do some kind of robot? Start with one of Will's or Ron's sample codes and then try and tweak it and see if they can. not And who would be interested to do that for a contest yet this year, like late November, December? I know Murray is. OK. Uh, OK, I, I can't volunteer to actually do contest. I'm going to actually download the code and play with it. But I, I won't, between now and December, have time to actually contest. <laughs> OK. <laughs> But Ron, I do. I'm gonna. I'm all, I've got the web page. I'm gonna download it. And I'm a Java cool. programmer, so I would be happy to play with it. Oh, just, cool! That's great. Yeah, I'd be happy to play with it. I just won't have time to make a robot out of it for now. No, no, no. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'll be interested. To, so, have you ever played with processing? Processing? I can't say it. My voice no, is good. No, I have it. I've, I've, but I actually am interested in doing that. So it's okay. a good opportunity okay. for me. To do Great. That. Thank you. Great. I mean, really, there's nothing to stop you if you're familiar with Java. Uh, really, it's not difficult to set up a, a project that uses processing. Pro I get my brain. I can't say it now. Process, processing. Anyway. Is it, is uh, it actually processing? Processing. I don't know what's happened. I think I've had uh, some neurological problem here. 
I don't know. Is it literally processing, processing plus another ing? Processing. Processing. <laughs> processing. <laughs> oh, okay. It doesn't have an extra ing. No, I've been adding it. I'm, I've gone nuts. Anyway. Okay. So anyway, you if you're used to Eclipse or something like that, really yeah. process, processing. Processing. Uh, can you know i never say it i've heard people that never say something and then when they're asked to say it they say it wrong anyway so this java environment that has a an arduino like interface you don't have to use it and if anything they have a library a core library and if you're more familiar with eclipse then you can import their library and then import my library the line following simulation and then uh, really, you're good to go. You could take one of the example sketches, and I, I guess the only problem there is, okay, the way processing works uh, is they have sort of a, a front, uh, sort of probably like Arduino. They have a, a uh, what do you call it, a preprocessor. <laughs> Don't let me say that word wrong. A preprocessor that uh, combines a bunch of these uh, uh, what they call tabs or files into one single file. So it, to take an example, uh, to take a demo uh, program, it might be a little bit of a hassle because you would probably end up ha packing it all into one file. And it probably would take more time to muck with that than just to bring up processing and, uh, and you know, fire up the library or whatever. So I think that would probably be easier now that I think about it. And the other thing that's different, just to mention, and I guess I should make, I think in the documentation I make some mentions, the one weird thing is processing uh, expects all uh, constants to be uh, uh, floats, 32-bit uh, floats, so you don't have to append an F because it automatically says, you know, 5.0 is a 32-bit float. And it, of course, it's convenient because if you have a hundred constants in your program, you don't need all those Fs, you know, uh, uh, appended to the numbers. But uh, also, a nice thing about working in Eclipse is if you're used to, well, let me backtrack. Within processing, you can use .java files. So if you want to have classes that are not internal to the processing uh, class, which is the way the program is written, you end up you know, it's cool because you have access to all their methods, but it's not cool in that you don't have, you know, everything is public, sort of, so to speak, ish. Anyway, I probably said too much about that, that, that you can read about that. And, 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 uh, but anyway, that's my, my story. Any, any okay, other I, questions? The only thing I can say is, Ron, thank you very much for posting it. It's very generous of you to not just put the time in, but also to put it up on GitHub so we can play with it. It's, it's a, it's really quite, a consequent consequential thing here's the word i can't say for the day consequential thing for the robot community i think this is really really cool and i think the seattle club and other clubs can possibly dig into this as well this could be a real milestone for for simulation and also just for the whole community i think it's a really great thing thank you great well thank you yeah and i guess the goal here too is it's not an overly complicated simulator and the other thing that is kind of neat is it does I'm sure there, there are some very elaborate platforms uh, you know, out there that are just amazing. But the neat thing is you can dig into this, in particular, just as an example, the robot class that's really not visible in the processing uh, environment use. But you can go in and look at that class and even pull it out, and that would be a good basis for your odometry if you want to fool mm -hmm. with that. But anyway, you get to see all the simple ideas as far as is where uh, a model is defined where we have acceleration and deceleration rates. And then you get to see the, in fact, the, the, the uh, user's guide also, I stepped through that, talks about how we integrate the, you know, acceleration rates to come up with velocities and velocities to come up with positions. And the math and the, you know, the code is pretty simple there. And so I'm hoping that even if you didn't care about line following, some of the simple robot dynamics uh, are, are cool in themselves. And you could just make your own robot that dro drove around and, you know, who cares about following the line sort of thing. Well, one of the things that I'm looking forward to trying when I get the time is that for those of you who, are, who might not know, um, I, like I've been a Java programmer for like since the 90s and I've been using Eclipse for like 20 years, I think, as a daily user. Wow. But in last year, I started on my project 
uh, my robot project in order to learn Python. And I'm actually a really enthusiastic Python programmer. I actually really love the language. So one of the things I want to try with your code is there's a, uh, a Python Java mix called Jython. And you can basically bring Python code into a Java environment. And what I'm kind of thinking I might try to do is even at just as a beginner, like a hello world thing, is to make a simple Python robot and bring it into your environment. And then I can basically see if I can get the actual Python environment I've been working on on my real robot to bring ah. that somehow. And then basically we could have, for anybody using your simulator, you could either use it as a Java simulator for people just who are interested in the simulator. But then if, since you've open sourced this thing, it's now possible to ba basically make a bridge into a Python environment so anyone running a Python robot could theoretically use the simulator sure. and then maybe somebody else could try this with C++ and maybe do an Arduino version as well. Yeah, interesting. You know, one thing that does I, I'm curious about and I haven't explored is uh, processing has a Python uh, interpreter uh, built in or whatever, a mode they call it. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering, I'm guessing that the library would be able to be utilized, the Java library. I wonder how that works. In other words, you might be able to write your uh, your robot code all in, in Python and have a very simple process. I'll have to see how that goes. I did do a little conversion. Uh, when, In fact, when I started this project, uh, I started it independently of, of a, a similar thing that I did about some years ago with a little more elaborate with 3, 3D robots and stuff, but I wanted this to start out simple. So I kind of started back over from scratch, but I actually started this and wrote or translated pretty quickly a, a, a model of it for Dave Ackley that, that was a so in Python, but a very, uh, you know, I didn't keep that up to date, but uh, so I did do the, the rudimentary uh, 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 robot uh, simulator in Python, but it was not a lot to it and it didn't support the acceleration, deceleration. So it was, you know, set probably uh, speed and turn rate directly with no ramp up, ramp down. Uh, Dave might, if he's, I, I, if he's played with it, he probably knows more than I do, but that's okay. He, he may have forgotten more than I do by the time I'm even talking about it. I'll admit I've forgotten too much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, no problem. I it before last week, so I don't remember a thing about it. Okay. Yeah, at the time, I'll tell you, the program was so simple that it took me just a few hours to translate from Java to Python, which I know virtually nothing about. So I was able to quickly, you know, just get online. How do I do this in Python? You know, how do I blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, more or less for simple data structures and things, it was almost one to one. I forget a little differences in how classes are defined and stuff. And, or I, I don't even remember, but anyway, uh, but I do have that code and I'd be happy to dig that out uh, and share that too, just for fun. Hmm. And someone's asked about your toucan. Oh, <laughs> let's see. Oh, is he? I was going to show him off. He's uh, he, he got brought out. Uh, I can fire him up. Let's see. This is a project <laughs> I did about 10 years ago. Let's let me get my picture up so I can see what I'm showing you. Wait a minute. Uh, hang on. I don't see myself. It makes me nervous. Wait a minute. Then if I could see myself, then I'll know what I'm showing you in one second. Okay, I stopped presenting, correct? Correct. correct. Okay, okay, hang on. Okay, one second. Mm -hmm. Oh, there I am. Okay, great. Now I can get a picture. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, so the 2KN, let's see. He, uh, he is a product that I built the controller for, wherever the controller is, I guess I can show you. Uh, for a company called Axtel Expressions, and they make, uh, they're a puppet company, but about, I guess, gee, more than 10 years ago, I teamed up with a guy that was still here in Dallas that uh, built uh, robots um, that were then sold, and I've got to think what the, uh, Probotics was the company he sold to uh, Dave uh, Jenkins, uh, Jan Janky, sorry, Dave, sorry, Dave, if you're out there in the ether and hear me, mispronounce your name. Anyway, but uh, Ron was uh, big into uh, into 
not this Ron, but Ron Palmer was big into animatronics. And he built the uh, prototype for this character, but Axtell Expressions built the puppets. But anyway, uh, now fast forward about, I don't know how many years, more than 10 years. Yeah, this, this puppet right here is, uh, he's actually uh, designed uh, for ventriloquists. So he can, he can actually, uh, if we're lucky here, he can talk as I talk. So you could look at him, wait a minute. Hey, Ron, how's it going? What's, what's, what's happening? <laughs> Uh oh, the phone's ringing. Let me shut it up. But anyway, so this guy has. Uh, I've got a scam call. Sorry about that. Okay. Anyway, uh, so this robot has an alive mode. Oh, the other thing I might be able to demo. Let's see. Um, I'll tell you what. Well, if I can't get it pretty quick, we can shut me up, and I'll I'll find a. A demo of the uh, of the uh, puppet. Oh, it'll take me a few minutes actually. Maybe we'll save him to next week. I'll tell you what. Next week I'll do a toucan demo. So, um, uh, but uh, for now he's just in a live mode, and I can also I can also tell him to go to sleep, and I can tell him you know to, with a little key fob to turn his head and so forth. But uh, Axtell Expressions makes these puppets, and I make the uh, controller uh, for it anyway. Very so cool. That's, Very nice. that's the story. Well, that's cool. Now, <laughs> now, we're, now we're really pumped up, Ron. That's, that's pretty awesome. We were noticing him beak in the background for oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to bring him out because they were having trouble with their fobs uh, range problem, and I don't know. So it's been a while. They've Their, their sales have slowed down a bit during the, uh, the uh, COVID crisis. You know, entertainers are sort of, uh, I don't know, they're not entertaining quite so much anymore so mm -hmm. although this is a perfect uh thing because this this uh, animal can't can't uh, uh contact covid i don't think i don't think he can become <laughs> sick <laughs> good for something but yeah okay well thanks again and, uh all right so and my screen wasn't totally uh visible to everybody so one more time i i think i got at least there's going to be jean myself will and ron chasing after this environment now, did I miss anyone else in the show of hands? I think oh, Donna I didn't raise my hand. I'm, I'm kind of fried. <laughs> Good. No, I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll get you. Okay. So we're going to do some. We'll, we'll figure uh, that out. I'll Donna, get, we'll, we'll get some rolls or something going, but at least the uh, link is in the chat window there. And we have a kind of baseline commit that we can all at least start off on the same repo commit version, even if Ron starts to carry it forward some more. We can use the current state. So, okay, so uh, quick, uh, quick question, Carl. So the uh, the the Ron uh, Ram, Ron Grant forward slash LFS. That's going to be our repo that we base yeah, entry off of. That's, correct. That's the latest and greatest he's yes. got, and we'll use that as our basis. He's got a nice okay. license attached to it now. Awesome documentation. Okay, great. Clean classes. Okay. He's got clear segmentation between robot responsibilities, simulator environment responsibilities, judge responsibilities. He's got a really, really nice environment for our interest, I'd say. Great. Uh, and Great. I think he can even support mechanic wheels. So I'm gonna try and do, <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do one of those. The, the focus now will be, uh, obviously it's working well enough that these, you know, I can show off these demo robots and I'm not having to scratch my head too often. Uh, but I do see there's a few little minor inconsistencies and things like that. And I, my plan is now is to go through those, but I'm not going to uh, fall prey to my own desire to make changes and re make things better and whatever. I, I think overall, it to me, it has the feel of reasonableness. So I, I want to be careful now not to step on on uh, waste people's time by making lots of changes and and so forth so i'm really going to do my best not to, to to mess something up but at the same time too i would like to be able to write a controller i have written you know i i, I bragged and and i probably have you know reasonable progress on a controller for this but uh but anyway uh but i i'm hoping to actually use it and in a way that'll help me uh test for bugs and so forth too. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward logic. So 
I, I don't think uh, it should be too horrible to people. You know, it's not a tremendously complicated program. Cool. Yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll sort out the details as we go, but let's let's see what we can do. And I'm half thinking that if we can't get if we don't get any cool presentation lined up for the mid October October one. Maybe what we can do is turn it into a uh, the regular monthly meeting for Robot Club DPRG. Maybe what we can do is have a kind of workshop, and try and just walk through the steps to help people get set up. Yeah, yeah, that sounds for, great. For example, so just because I'm and I'm running out of steam on being able to find uh, fresh presenters. So <laughs> okay, so let's move around here. We got nine twenty eight. Got to keep on moving. Uh, Harold's down to the Rubik's Cube now, so uh, uh, and, anything and else in the Rubik's Cube going on, Harold? And I have to apologize and leave. We just had a time zone change, so it's an hour later here, and I've actually got to leave in about a minute. So, oh, uh, man, so off to work. Well, you see you, Yep. Take see care. you next week. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, bye. Yeah, this is what uh, keeps me attentive during meetings. <laughs> with my PO and um, you know I'm a, I'm a banger on the keyboard right that's what we're doing and so we, we get invited to all these meetings and I, I think I need to be in there because sometimes this kind of we're talking the UI you know how do we want the UI to look Because you know I'm gonna have to code that or one of my team is and let's talk about this but they devolve not into uh, how the UI is going to look but why does that say verified and not match the words they get in devolved into that and at the time we get in these meetings it devolves into things where they're trying to figure out the functionality of the thing and i'm like that's well and good and that needs to happen but we're not here to figure out the functionality that you're trying to figure out for this thing that you want we're here to figure out how it's supposed to look i was hoping the figure functionality stuff was done well before you you've got me and other people involved that draw stick figures um but anyway that's just me venting um uh, Carl did see me vent earlier this week. Um, I've been playing around with uh, uh, my my robot brain and the uh, Latte Panda, talking to the Arduino on that thing. I've got some C-sharp code going, uh, the .NET framework, talking to it. I've got the, the standard for Mata on there, which basically is a pretty slick thing. It goes in, and most boards, it goes and figures out what can be PWM'd and analog and digital and that kind of stuff and allows you gives you a way to uh, poke into that. So I had a serious problem with that because you talk to it over the serial connector. And so I, I would I would start turning, basically I want to blink on LED, you know, I want to make sure I can talk to it. Hello world stuff. And so I'm sending my serial stuff down the command from the, uh, from the .NET side of the house. And it goes, it goes blip, 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 blip makes no sense i'm looking at the code that's going on doing it. and i figured that there was a there's a overrun error there's something going on crazy and i was going to try some other things uh last night on the on my stream and so i found this uh there's a from 2012 there is a fermata test program written in c plus plus and so i'm like screw it man let's just you can get it in the windows store and download it so I downloaded it so I didn't have to bother compiling it and stuff onto the on my latte pen. I said, well, let's see if this has a problem doing all this. And yeah, it does, sort of. Um, as I can click and turn the LED on and off, but I can click way faster than you actually turn it on and off. And I'm like, if, if me being a human can click faster than that thing can turn on and off, I don't think the robots, I don't think it's useful what I need to do. I'm like, well, what the heck? Let's try something else. And so somebody joined the channel. After I ran that, somebody joined my channel and was watching. I said, hey, let me show you what the problem is. I'm trying to debug, trying to get past. And I fired it up because because uh, I've got I set up remote debugging. So I've got Visual Studio running on my lab machine. It actually talks over to the Visual Studio debugger and runs the program local to the to the uh, on the Latte Panda. But then I get all the debugging stuff back back and forth. It's actually kind of cool how that works. Um, and I went to go show him. See here, boom! See it's going pretty quick now. It ought to slow down about now. It never slowed down. It's going as fast as it can go. I'm like, what the hell? I did. Did somebody 
I, I didn't change any code. I mean, I didn't change any code from, I did change a bunch of code, but not from the last time it didn't work to now this time it did work. The only thing I did different was run that test program. I'm thinking it that test program might have done some more things than I expected it to do. Set some <laughs> variables, set some stuff, those kind of things. Who knows? But now I, I tried a half a dozen different things, and I'm not only, you know, and 20 minutes later, not only am I uh, not blinking an LED anymore, I'm talking to uh, the, I'm sending down servo commands through Fermata, because Fermata, it has a servo right, so you can tell it, give it a pin and give it an angle between zero and 180 to tell it where, you know, basically a joystick on the thing. And so I'm sending stuff down and I've got motors going forward and backwards and figured out where the dead spot is in there to make them stop, stop the way they're supposed to stop. And it's done. I'm like, what the heck, man? You know, I, yeah, it confounded the crap out of me. I'm happy that they're working, which means now I need to go write another program to interface with my, uh, my joysticks here and then make the joysticks work and then have it running around on the ground, you know, and then, you know, which is progress. But I really would like to know because I know this problem is going to happen again. And I'm like, ah, but at least I'll do the same thing again. Hopefully they'll just fix it. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty certain it, it's setting some extra stuff in there when it fires up that Fermat instance when he's talking to it. I did find that if I do a serial monitor on Arduino coming back out of Fermat, that thing is spitting crazy amounts of stuff at me. And this card, you know, they're, they're all like uh, uh, three byte packets of things. You know, they're not, there's not much going on, but there's a lot of it coming back. And apparently it's a, I say three watt packets. It, it uses a, a MIDI protocol, like the standard MIDI that's been around forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, where you get a seven bit command and eight bit data. Um, yeah. And uh, that's what it's, that's what it's sending back and forth. And I, I need to find something to decode it eventually so I can see what it's trying to tell me. I have no idea what's going on on that. So anyway, that's me and that's my event. And um yeah, and hopefully uh, I'll have a remote control of this thing in not too distant future. Okay. We call that progress. Yeah, it is progress. Yeah. You have a lot to show you. I mean, you can see my motors move back and forth, but you guys already seen them. <laughs> so it doesn't really have a big deal. Um, but that, that's definitely progress. I was happy about that. I'm just not happy with how I got there, so to speak, because I have some unknowns that I know yeah. that come back and bite me. They'll I reveal themselves to you. Yeah. All right. Hopefully so hopefully so, you know, cool. that's what I was uh, really hoping to. Uh, it's one of the things. It's one of the tools I do not have, um, is an oscilloscope that, and especially one that decodes, right? So that I can yeah. get digital storage. Because I, I would have liked to be able to decode. At least I could see the bytes as they went across the thing and be able to trigger stuff, right? And I could do you some. You've got a logic analyzer, USB logic analyzer for yeah, like. I don't, I don't have one. Of, I don't have one of those either. See. Well, I I try to do, but it's around here somewhere, and I never did got the Sailey stuff all wired up correctly and get to have that actually work the way it's supposed and to the work. The Kickstarter well. thing we we got into, we're still waiting on. They're just in Kickstarter mode, so yeah. And um, hopefully, I did did a check on that about I don't know two three weeks ago, and they're still moving on and doing stuff. And I, I'm thinking sometime in November, I think is their latest. I hope so. Version. And they there's keep adding features, then COVID comes along and they add more features, then the, the factory slows down, then they add more features. So maybe we've got another couple of Chinese New Year's, but we'll get it sooner or later. Maybe. Maybe we'll get it sooner or later. And um, there, because I do not believe that there is any more earlier birds than uh, yourself, Carl, and myself on that list. Because we were pretty we're, early, I don't think. We're the last ones, huh? Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Their first bit was good. I, I trust them. So I trust them too. All right. And then when we get it, we'll have a good demo for everybody. But uh, yeah. that's, that's in the future. It's cool because I've got a pair. He's got a pair. And then if we ever get to see us in, in person in person again, we can do a four channel, um, basically oscilloscope between those two pairs and the blue. Yeah, basically, they're, they're, uh, they're single. They're individually single channel voltmeter oscilloscope things. But as a UI, they Bluetooth to your phone. And the thing is, is that if you do four of these, you can then get a four-channel oscilloscope using your phone or your tablet as the UI. It is a UI. Over Bluetooth. Yeah. So uh, it's really so a cool really idea. Important. I just, I, I, I know it's going to happen. It just hadn't happened yet. I, I, no, that's frustrating. I'm frustrated. 
what was their price? I think uh, a pair cost me what 150 bucks or something like yeah. that. Yeah, 70, 75 a piece. Yeah. And of course, it's a voltmeter and all the other things that you would think it would be, as well as the other stuff too. It's a multi-purpose thing, and your yeah. display is your phone or your tablet. Yeah, pretty neat stuff. Cool. Well, thank you, sir. So, uh, Mr. Kevin, what have you got this week? Anything interesting you want to show? Well, nothing interesting, but listening to everybody talk, PID conversation, very beneficial to me. And I'm still very odd about uh, the simulator that Ron built. So I definitely give that a try. Okay. Excellent. Maybe we can twist your arm and sh show us how it's done. <laughs> If it was a drone, how would it behave in our simulator? That's what we need to see. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks. Mr. Chris, how about you? Uh, nothing today, I'm afraid. Well, you've got the blur background working pretty good. I'm, I'm in awe on that. I can't get it to work on mine. I'm going to have to. Yeah, I don't know. It showed up, I guess. I think it's a new feature. I don't know. Okay, turn it on. Works. All right. Great. Yeah. It just worked for you. So way to go. That's worth something. Yeah, That's I good. think you need a, like a six-core machine or something. That's probably it. <laughs> Could be. But it's working so much better than the uh, Zoom magic background, right? Because the Zoom is all choppy, pixelated stuff, and yours is really smooth. But now that you mention it, my laptop, my, my browser is, is, is using a lot of CPU. The fan is blowing. I, I, now that you mentioned it, I think that's it. I mean, it's it's doing a lot of number crunching. My laptop is running full tilt. You know, and it's not you know, it's not using all cores because it's, it probably can't. But nonetheless, it's it's running full tilt. The fan's blowing, and and I gotta turn this thing off. I think it's a heater. Well, that explains why your lights dimmed. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think Mr. Uh, all the open CV routines where you know blurring of any kind, you know Gaussian or yeah, uh, you know it takes a lot of a lot of processing power, bunch of pixels. So I was going to mention because you earlier mentioned uh, you're looking for presenters for October, right? When said? Oh yeah, I think it's the tenth. It's the second Saturday of the month, and I've I've lost track of uh, things, so I I think you might have mentioned before when it, being able to present, but uh, and I totally lost track. Do you, is there a chance, Chris? You might have something yeah, to so show. The topic, the topic that's kind of dear to me also is simulation. Now, what what I would be presenting is is the environment I'm familiar with that I just briefly popped up the other day on the screen. And and I did I have been spending some time refreshing my memory because it's been five years that I, you know, when I when I spent uh, since I spent really a good amount of time in this, so I've been brushing up on it and and I did want to sort of get back into it and and sort of use this opportunity, but at the same time, you know, I didn't want it, I don't want it to look like I'm trying to present a a competing approach, right? So it's another it's another. You know, simulation package, and and uh, was going to talk about you know how you can use it and what you can do with it, um, and you know, but but I can do that in October or at another time if you guys want to sort of dedicate the slot for the, you know, for the competition type topic. So it's it's really up to you. Well, generous, thanks. So uh, I I bet well. If we gave an hour to each one, we'd have a two-hour meeting, and I don't, I don't know that it'd be too competitive. Uh, would it be too overwhelming? Well, I think if I, if I was going to talk, wouldn't we think we'd trim me down a bit? I think a lot of what I've said is, you know, maybe we can try to figure out a way that I, if I do any presenting, well, it's, you know, we do want time for other people for show and tell and so forth. So what if I target... 20 minutes or something like that. Well, see, I was thinking, Ron, for your part, that we could do like actually a, uh, um, like a, a startup from scratch. So, oh yeah, okay. Download you know, processing and all that. Yeah, so like 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 literally just step at a time, and uh, and then here's like a how to. It was kind mm -hmm. of what I had. I was thinking, but. Uh, because you have stepped through a bunch of stuff, but it was more like ad hoc. 
and uh, I, don't, I don't know. It, you know, not- maybe I'm wondering if maybe I could make a YouTube video and go through it. That way, we wouldn't have to dominate the meeting time. Yeah. And uh, I wonder about that because then, you know, in a YouTube video, I could I could go through the whole process of downloading, processing. Process. I'm blown away. Something's wrong with my head. Anyway, uh, downloading the program and downloading the library, and then, you know, I would just sort of go through each step, and might have a few things to say. That way, somebody could look at that on their own time and not uh, suffer. That sounds like a great idea. Okay. I think we're sold then. Okay. So, Chris, I mean, if you're on I, board. I could do a little highlight, maybe, but not not the grueling step through everything. I think if anything, okay. uh, probably by the meeting, I'll have a, a, a decent display that'll enumerate all the sensors that you have defined and that sort of thing. And, and, and maybe have a few words to say, but I, I don't want to create a grueling long deal, uh, but I might create a grueling video for people. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's do it that way then, Chris. If you're game, we'll, we'll put you on as the main presenter for October 10, and with severe gratitude all around, uh, very much so. And, and Ron, we can, uh, we can give an update from yours uh, and however that is, and we'll, we'll move along. That's great. And then we'll decide whether, whether we keep moving forward with LFS or do we put it in the garbage? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think I, so. I think the timing is not ideal because I don't want – to pitch a competing approach, right? You guys oh, are pretty no. well invested in this approach. So I don't want to, I don't want to steer anybody in a different direction. But at the same time, you know, it, at the same time, it's it's something that's in the in, in, in everybody's mind right now. Okay, doing yeah. something in simulation. So it's a, you know good to hear and see other ways of sure. doing it. I just didn't mean to sort of, you know, sell something different. No, 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 no. That's good. Not a problem. It'll be awesome. Cool. Yeah, it might. Hey, it might inspire me too. Um, because that, if anything, I do tend to work in a vacuum. I, you know, I like to do my own thing, and often I don't research what's available. Uh, but I do have enough background that I, I can survive without that. But uh, often people have brilliant ideas. And I'm sure I've been influenced over the, over time. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I've, I probably have seen things and just probably working with elaborate programs and, and uh, tools, you know, 3D tools and things like that. You get so ideas. Ron, Ron, this means you have two weeks to get your own robot controller going before you get a whole long <laughs> list of ideas to put into your own environment. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Cool. All right. We got us a plan. So how about Mr. Mr. Ackley, Mr. Dave, any uh, updates from you? Hey, um, I've been playing around with my robot uh, dynamometer. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, it's it's not ready for show for prime time. Uh, I could maybe do something in the November time frame if that was worthwhile. Oh, excellent. But, uh, the other thing is this, this little thing I'm playing with right here. It turns out that DF Robots now has a real tire to go with the TT motors. These are about a dollar fifty, and then it costs you about uh, ten twenty dollars to get them shipped. But anyhow, <laughs> they're they're a real tire instead of that plastic crappy things that you get in the kits. Oh, nice. Good, good, grippy, soft rubber. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, let's put it this way. It's not super gripping like one might really want, but it's certainly a lot better than that plastic crap that they have. Right. Well, cool. That's all I got. All right. So you think maybe November time frame, some, some dynamometer kinds of demos of some kind? Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. Very good. Mr. John, how are things in, in your world? Okay. I haven't really worked on the robot. and said I did 12 miles of kayaking the other day. So, oh. <laughs> so maybe, hopefully I'll get to look at Ron's cone there. I'll try to yeah. 
made a point of doing that though. So oh, that's good. That's good. By next week, we'll have a bunch of questions. Maybe. So where's the kayak? <laughs> uh, close by. Basically, yeah. did well six miles one way and six miles back. So I went up the river in hours. And I think there, well, I guess there could be a couple rivers around here, but the main one. <laughs> Trinity? Yep. Over by the, well, effectively up by the colony area and the two potents between the two. Oh. Very good. All right. Well, thanks. So, uh, Mr. Sean, how about you this week? Yeah, I uh, uh, it's good. So I made some progress on my. Uh, I got this Mega two five six zero board, and uh, the over the weekend I spent some time to wire it up, and I do want to ask you guys for opinion. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I want to explain to you how I wired, and just want to get some critique from you guys. So what you see is this is a Mega 2560. Uh, I've got two of these um, driver module here. It's called uh, MD. Anyway, it's got two motor drive. But um, if you look at the detail, there's this like uh, two row of pins that gets the DC and the uh, you know all the digital signals coming in and the the I don't know can you guys see see this at yeah. all yeah okay. so um so the way I wired is okay by the way I have a battery I'm using this for my battery connector yeah. so basically I have a flat battery let me see where my battery is this is my battery Okay, oh, yeah. just a stationary. <laughs> but I find if I use a connector like this to get it out and then put this in, so the, these two, I, I, I thought it's a good arrangement, but I want to get your opinion. <laughs> and so does these motors. These motors come in, uh, used to have this uh, six wire, basically it's a six wire um, with a, what do you call this? This one row of pins, female yeah. connector, right? So I took it out, and I I changed this into a same thing of this little connector, and and on my motor drive. So this is the input to my motor. Uh, this is the output of my motor drive. That's how I arrange this power. I mean, first question. I mean, hopefully. This is not too stupid, <laughs> but I just, I just find uh, wiring is an issue for me. <laughs> so, uh, so this is one question that whether this connector is a good thing or, or there's better arrangement. Uh, coming back to this six pin, uh, I mean, it's 12. It's like uh, one row is the DC and five volt. I mean, the ground and five volt. The other row is this... Uh, um modulated analog what call this uh i forgot it's the 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 pin that gives you a modulated signal oh gosh PWR. pwm and then two digital signal is like disabling enabling the two motors so for now i'm doing this one i'm i'm like anyway i'm i'm changing to this I'm changing to this. So I just bought, um, I don't know, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. So it's a connector, and I wired uh, this uh, 12 wires on it. What I'm thinking is mm -hmm. a plug, I mean, this is what I did this weekend, right? It's kind of a hack. For the next one, I'm going to have one wire plug in, and the end of this wire, I'll go wherever it needs to go. So this is another thing. I hope it's an improvement, but I want to get you guys get opinion from you guys whether 
John, that's looking that's looking good because what what I, what it looks like to me at least is that you're connectorizing your robot, yeah, yeah. yeah. and you've got good use of uh, um, heat shrink, right? So it seems like you have decent shielding. You got uh, twisted gear really. wire. I just bought a bought a like a heater, <laughs> but I'm yeah. I, I was worried about these things shorting out. So I think this is good. It won't short oh, yeah. out. But uh, earlier, I I was worried about that. Uh, but I just got a heat heat to gone, <laughs> like just arrived. Yeah. So that, that helps a lot. Now the two questions: Is this a good connector for power? Or how well, do you connect? I, at least, okay, I was going to jump in with the thought. And the first is that you can get, there's lots of varieties on that kind of connector. So I just got, uh, if you can see my screen, Amazon yeah. for, you can get like a buck or buck 50 a piece. So I just got handfuls of them. Now, what I found with these, the nice thing is, is that they're already terminated. They're not as bulky and they're not as susceptible to the screws coming loose as the, uh, the ones you have. But I found that sometimes they don't, um, I mean, they're decent for higher power things, but sometimes with a little bit of motion, they can have some like glitches. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I found, and then sometimes they, they get a little bit loose so they don't make the best connection. So I've stopped using these for power in a lot of cases. And what I use for power instead is you'll see, like on a lot of robots, people use these uh, XT60 connectors. Yeah. yeah, and you can get them already terminated with cables. So all you have to do is solder, or screw the cable in, or you can get them to where uh, they come like this. Uh, you can get them in bulk, and they're kind of cheap, right? Uh -huh. So you can get yeah. them, but it, it takes a kind of hefty soldering iron to solder on these, and then it takes some technique to do it, where you can solder without melting the the plastic. What's the name of that connector? It's well, called. It's a. I'm it's sorry, a I'm just it, Carl. I had to do the same thing uh, with you. And yes, there are some of my connectors on my robot that may have a little bit of darkness on some of this. <laughs> but yeah, they work well. Like I found here, I don't know about you, but sometimes if I overheat it, I've actually melt. And some of them are cheaper. They use cheap plastic yeah. instead of high temp nylon or whatever. And, and so sometimes if you're not very careful, you can actually misalign the pin really yeah. badly and just wreck it. I've, I've done that too. They're called, they're called point, uh, just sorry to interrupt. Uh, just thinking about your you're mentioning the loose barrel connector problem. Well, I think as long as you keep I don't know if I'm on picture or not. Uh, as long as you kind of know if it if it if it starts to feel loose, then you got a problem. But if it feels yeah. snug and you're but it is good to wiggle on them a little bit and see if it'll introduce a you know a glitch or a failure, then yeah. Yeah, I'd be nervous, but yeah, I, I like your connector better than a barrel connector. But boy, they, you know the barrel connectors aren't bad as long as they're not loose. But sometimes exactly. they can be missized because there's size variations that are very yeah. close. Yeah. yeah, but they're it's hard to beat the price, and they come yeah. already terminated, and they're a lot less bulky than the ones with, and they don't have the screw problem. Right, screws come loose when you're just screwing things down. So I like soldered connections, soldered connections, and good. Yeah. Almost no spec kind of connectors, right? Or at least good enough for RC planes that have a lot of vibration. Right. And then so there's another on that link. Same line are of plastic. 60s. That's what Carl Carl has XT sixties. There's yeah. a smaller version of that if you don't want to go bulky. They're called XT thirties. And really what that thirty and sixty rating is is how much current you're gonna be throwing through there. If you're not gonna be throwing like sixty amps or whatever I think the sixty implies. Maybe right. you don't need that big and bulky connector, you know, but it's more than much. It's it, they're really good connectors. They're really good XT60, XT30 is what we used in the drone community. Yeah. But really, it's been shifting over to the Anderson Power Pole, uh, which the old hams used to use. So, Anderson Power Pole, you could clamp it down. So, I would consider that as well as XT60, XT30s. Anderson Power Pole. Yeah, that's uh, very big on the ham community. Uh, huh. and lately, on the drone side, they're changing over to the Anderson Power Pole. Interesting. Yeah, maybe if Kevin, if you could find a link and put it in there, I, I see uh, powerworks.com or something. I'll put the link. Okay, put the link. Cool. And then there's another one for smaller signal connectors. So I, I find two and three and four pin versions of these and again you can get 
just a fistful of them for five or ten bucks of pairs. Mm -hmm. those and these are the ones I use for lower power. Like I use these for the motor connectors, and you know they're they're keyed red and black, so you have polarity, and um, and they're mechanically keyed, so you can't put them in the wrong way. Right. And they're all, all you need to do is solder them down on the other end. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I've, I highly recommend. They're not hard to find. I can dig up the ones I found, but two and three and four. There you go. Um, I Molex connected. I, I have to look it up. I forget what brand. Yeah, I think that's what they are. It's interesting. You like the, the one pre-wired, but the, what do you do with the wire? Because you have to terminate it somewhere. I mean, you solder it, well, you're dealing with the board, right? You're dealing with Yeah, the... I, I just solder it into the board. Solder it in. Sol solder it into this board? I mean, look, it's the... This one goes to the board, right? You have a you have a controller well, board. So, so sometimes then what I do is get a... Uh, let's see. Uh, you, know, you can just get the. <laughs> yeah, do, do uh, I haven't found a, the proper way to do it. I think would be to make a circuit card and then, like like Dave Anderson showed, you make a breakout that that plugs in uh, like a daughter board, or you, you can get the um, you can get the proto boards for the Arduinos, and they have they have uh, the you can put a header pin so it plugs into the Arduino. And then it has uh, copper lands that drag out, so you can solder these to copper lands. So you can make your own breakout board for the Arduino. The other thing I'll do is I'll just get these header pins, and then I'll just I'll just solder directly onto here, and I'll do some kludgy way to strain relief the wire, and then I'll just plug these in to the uh, I'll plug those into the uh, the header uh -huh. of the Arduino. And I think Dave Ackley was showing another. Uh, High class approach, a little higher on the vi the video camera. What are those, Dave? Two pots. Uh -huh. Box of what? Two. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. where I'm going. <laughs> the stew pot uh, with the. Uh, yeah, I got a box of those just the other day too. Boxes of boxes of black things. All in a row. It's stew pot uh, sh uh, shell. Put right. these in, but um, yeah, it's. I'm just directly wiring from the the two balls together with all my wires. Oh yeah, the, the other thing I want to mention. Um, so I have a paper paper cardboard, <laughs> and um, I find I can punch holes onto these paper cardboard, and put a put a zip tie. So. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it worked for me, but what do you guys think? <laughs> so it's like I just, I just put everything down, lay it out on the paper. Cardboard. I call Carl Ott is the specialist in uh, cardboard and uh, duct tape. Duct, duct tape. Why not, man? <laughs> you know, if it keeps it from moving around, if it doesn't catch fire, and if it's sturdy Actually, enough, if it works for you, what's wrong with it? Yeah, well, Carl and I got to go to Vegas on that basis. We, we went to Vegas with cardboard and duct tape. Okay, um, AT and T well, paid our way. So, um, I I'm so I got this wired up. I, I was going to characterize this controller, and I'm planning to do this by uh, using the computer serial communication to the board. We use a USB cable, and I want to write. Um, I mean, I can write some program reading. Basically, the bot will keep pumping information out and receiving commands from the computer. Um, but it, what do you guys think? I mean, basically, it's like a distributed uh, robot idea, right? I mean, I'm, I'm establishing communication to this bot uh, with, with the USB and the serial pod. But uh, do you guys, if this, I mean, it's it's gonna be some work, but I I think it's not too much. I just I just have to define my protocol, <laughs> like what it outputs. I have to parse it, and I need to send in some strings to to control the speed. Uh, mm -hmm. but 
do you guys have I mean so you, when you get your robot done, is the robot gonna be mobile? I mean, is the wire gonna stop the robot from doing what it's doing? I think um, later, I'm thinking later, I'll put a computer or a laptop or something with a USB port on top of this controller. And maybe that computer or uh, is communicating from outside with the Wi-Fi. But um, I, I think if I spend time to make this USB zero work, it won't be a total waste of time. Uh, but but I like the idea that uh, I mean just now you guys were talking about controller. I mean I, I want to see the controller. I want to see the the error, the output versus time, and th that'll tell me what's what it is doing. But uh, so I, that's my plan. But uh, it, it's it, it's going to be some work. If you guys have a, a better way, I I would like to hear some suggestions. I got one one item. Uh, so California, when we build the prototype, a lot of people use pegboard. You could buy those at Home Depot, and pegboard already has those holes drilled in. So you could cut it easily. Rather than using cardboard, you could use the pre-drilled holes to put, you know, wire, run your wires around, and you could um, clamp two together. So you might want to consider using the pegboard. Pad the wall. Oh, you mean the pad wall? Yeah, yeah, for the wall, right, right. Pad wall. And it's easy to cut because it's got so many holes, right? It's like perforated. I see, I see, I see. Just put it on the edge of the start of the table. On a robot, you could use the the perf board, right? I mean the, you know, that the type you use for circuit prototyping minus the copper, right? Just the, just the, yeah, whatever the material is called with all the holes in it, right? They have it with and without the copper traces, or you know. So mm -hmm. that's the same concept, just on a smaller scale, right? The holes are there, and if you use small enough screws, you can can kind of go straight into those, yeah, you know, yeah. those right. things. This is with copper, but they even have it without copper. Yeah, yeah. just oh, yeah. plain old. Oh. I don't know if you guys know this one. <laughs> I bought yeah. it. Uh, for a belt like years ago and my what my son has been using this but I find I can punch a hole on the cardboard just like I just punch it <laughs> and it's a neat small hole with with different size um, I, I think I mean yeah the the cardboard I like it <laughs> also the other thing using it, um, you could and... use you could use standoff those are little plastic parts so instead of going sideways, you could stack it up. Mm -hmm. So those yeah, so, are called standoffs, uh, nylon yeah. standoffs. Yeah. And they I, make you stack your layers on top. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it took me a while to stand up. Ah, uh, uh, I see what you mean. Yeah. All right. Good. I'll, I'll see that. Uh, I think standoff is a good thing. So have. standoffs, right? Have you seen any standoffs before? I've seen that. Yeah. 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 Well, again, Amazon's yeah. wonderful because you can just get a box of random sizes of these. That's actually a robotics. Yeah, but okay, I mean, nice. I don't have it. I, 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 I know what it is. I'll get some. Ten, ten bucks, you get an assortment that's good yeah. for a handful of robots. So probably nylon is even better because it's. Well, yeah, they got nylon, metal. Yeah. Yeah. So there's nylon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Good, yeah. Ask, ask the uh, Ubernet, and it'll it'll re reveal it to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen, I've got the pain to have happen in the morning. Dental work and me don't aren't going to be doing good. So yeah. I'm going to get out of here, and I wish everybody well, and I'll see you guys later. Fantastic. Take care, Harold. See you. Good luck with Fermata. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for uh, my uh, for for the suggestions. I yield <laughs> my time, so it's all good. good time. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Did we miss anybody? I don't think so. I think we managed to get around in two and a half hours. Pretty good. Yeah. Great discussion tonight. Cool. All right. So there you go. Marching orders. Let's see. Download LFS from Ron Grant. Let's see if we can't put it to use and. See where we can go by next Tuesday. Okay. Or whatever. Whatever we want to do. <laughs> it's the fun of it. So okay, guys. Nice to see y'all. 
Until Thank next you. time. Oh, take Carl. Care. Hey, time. Carl. Yes, Carl. Before we take off, so sure. you, uh, you'd commented at the beginning that you were going to give a a small update at least on your contest. You know, oh. the virtual contest. I, I, if you said it, I missed some of the parts. No, of no, no. I, I did. I did promise that, didn't I? And uh, uh, it was so small, it was easy to blink and miss it. So, so basically, uh, Ron gave the lion's share of it. And what I was trying to get at, what I was, what I was trying to um, between us coax out of, of us was that uh, Ron Ron has has gotten the environment I think to where it's stable enough that he's comfortable to put it out there, and it's probably not going to change all that much. It's had some relatively big uh, pivots in the last two weeks, but I think it's relatively stable now. And um, as a club, uh, we haven't we at the uh, Dallas the DPRG side we haven't yet gotten the details nailed down, but okay. we we have Ron's environment that's pretty stable. We have the draft proposal of rules that uh, Doug has uh, put out there. I think they're on. Um, I have to dig them out. I'm pretty sure they're on the DPRG.org, but they're at the very least at the DPRG GitHub contests slash something or other in there. And uh, as the, so, we have a kind of a uh, we have a kind of a gel forming, right? The ice is starting to crystallize. And the way, uh, although we were normally we would have these contests in November, um, just because we're getting a kind of a little late start and we are where we are, the idea was to maybe pick a date in December. Okay. All right. Probably in the get the last I heard, the guess would be like mid mid December. So it's not too close to Thanksgiving and it's not too close to Christmas. Uh, and at the end, it gives us, you know, now that we have uh, an environment we can start to push against and we have a date we can start to push against. I think Ron has gotten so far, right? He's got these sample codes. Anybody should be able to take the sample code. And if all they do is to change it so that it, it has a kind of a different shell, right? And a different timing on the sample rate, you could start with what he or, or will have, and you could have a different robot. Mm -hmm. um, or if you want to go crazy, you could you could you could do what some of us will probably wind up not sleeping and doing instead. But um, yeah, so that's that's about all. all I hopefully that answers your question. But as much and as little as we know. Okay, that's fine. Yep. We got, got something to push against. So. That's yeah, right. if, uh, if you all in Seattle are, are game for it, and if that can work, uh, we can we can work offline or in this this meeting we can we can kind of zero in on a on a time to hold it. Uh, probably the normal DPRG meeting time is the second Saturday of the month. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. we have uh, everybody trained for that, which would mean if we do December, just uh, with them to the air. So I think we're talking that that would be the twelfth of December. Okay. And that probably, I'm just thinking out loud, that'd probably be better than the 19th because the 19th is getting close to Christmas. Right. So, okay. All right. You know, and so, okay. And, and then so for December 12th, we're literally talking about a virtual contest for the Lion Simulator itself, right? And and yeah. nothing else, I right? I'm president of DPRG. I'll just throw it out there. We'll pencil it in. And if somebody okay. wants to change the idea, we can discuss it. But uh, then that would fit our our 12th of December meeting time. Okay, great. I'll, I'll split, I'll spread the world word over at uh, SRS. Okay. Cool. And we got a kind of a tentative plan. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Anything else we forgot to cover? Okay. Oh, well, a lot of fun, a lot of progress tonight. Okay, guys, I hope you all have a great, great week. Take care, stay safe, wear masks and, uh, yeah. Just don't turn on the TV. There's no good from that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Carl. Good Thanks night, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.